Hey, I'm Derek, it's me, Derek, and welcome to my cringe years. Uh, 15 years ago, I was standing in this hallway, um, in this apartment, talking about Metal Storm, making my very first video ever. My first episode of the Happy Video Game Nerd. It was the first video I ever made, and I call it my cringe years, even though I do think that, uh, I think these videos are kind of still enjoyable to a, to a certain degree. They were of a different time, of a different place. In 2007, YouTube, the retro gaming scene, the internet, Derek, <laughs> was, it was, it was different. It was all such a different time. So a lot of these videos that you're gonna be watching here, yeah, they, I think they age very strangely. Some of them are pretty bad. I think some of them are actually kind of good. I know a lot of people still like these old videos. I never did take them down. The original ones are still there. However, uh, at one point I made an HVGN DVD and I had to uh, re-edit a lot of my earlier videos because I actually edited them on a friend's computer and the original files, the original project files, were lost. But I still had all the original components. So they were re-edited and a much slightly, slightly better uh, quality, but they were only ever on the DVD. Well, now they're gonna be here on YouTube. Um, and uh, so sit back and enjoy. Go back to 2007 when the when something like the Happy Video Game Nerd was a clever idea. Listen, these are rough videos. They're rough. I am dead fucking serious. They're kind of cringe. It's like a song, weird Sonic the Hedgehog thing, even though I never really liked Sonic the Hedgehog. Listen, I'm taking you back to the past. We're going back to before YouTube uh, had HD, before YouTube had unlimited time. Videos needed to be under 10 minutes, under 100 megs, and you could only do 480 at the highest. So, this is, these are a time capsule. Should have brought some wine. Should have been, should have brought some wine, but here's approximately where it was. Fun fact, so 15 years ago, I was standing right here reviewing Metal Storm for the Nintendo. At the time, that game was 16 years old. 15 years ago, so these videos are now almost as, they're becoming as old as the games were at the time. I want to thank everybody who has been watching ever since 2007, uh, when this whole damn thing started. 15 years now. 15 years now. Standing right here. Um, so, enjoy me with long hair and not as much facial hair. Enjoy the early years of Derek Alexander. Enjoy the happy video game nerd. with you about this one. Oh boy, I love this game. I mean, I loved it as a kid growing up, and I love it just as much now. It's one of my favorite games for the Nintendo. And in terms of action, you know, I put it up there with like the Mega Mans, the Castlevanias, the first two Double Dragons, the Ninja Gaidens. I mean, this game kicks ass. It makes me so happy. <sighs> but I'm upset. The only really unfortunate thing about Metal Storm is I don't have anybody to share my enthusiasm with. I mean, it's sad, but Metal Storm was a game that was completely overlooked, left behind, and forgotten. 
And you know, I talk to friends all the time, we wax nostalgic about our favorite games growing up, and I always drop Metal Storm. And they say, oh, I've never heard of that one. I mean, I've never met anybody who has heard of and has played this game. But it's not even anecdotal either. I mean, I go on websites all the time and read magazines and they have their top 10, top 25, you know, most underrated games of all time, best games for the Nintendo. I mean, I've never seen Metal Storm on any of those. I mean, to quote Nintendo Power themselves, this may be one of the most underrated action games of all time. I am dead fucking serious. This game is great! In early 1991, Irene released Metal Storm for the 8-bit Nintendo Entertainment System. Irene is most known for creating one of the best classic shooter series of all time, R-Type. They are also responsible for Kickle Cubicle, another underrated NES classic, Holy Diver, and as well as the well-documented shitfest, Deadly Towers. It is worth mentioning that Deadly Towers was made nearly five years before Metal Storm. Now the first thing you'll notice is that the graphics are some of the best on the system. I mean, look at the detail of your little mech. The enemies are just as well designed. Man, dying never looked so good. Now the major gimmick and genius of Metal Storm is your ability to manipulate gravity. By simply pressing A while holding up or down, you'll jump to either the ceiling or back down to the floor. This is similar to Gravity Man stage in Mega Man 5, but I just want to point out that Metal Storm was made nearly two years before, and if anything, Capcom ripped off Irene. But either way, this is an amazing idea and they really ran with it. Every level is more ingenious than the last. And this game doesn't mess around. Either match the controls or be left behind. But this is by no means impossible. Metal Storm houses some of the tightest controls ever. Simply put, if you die, you can only blame yourself. Old school action gamers should have no problem picking this game up. Speaking of dying, when you inevitably lose all your lives, you will be confronted with the saddest game over music you've ever heard. And the future refused to change. Now I've read that people find this game to be very difficult, but if you're a seasoned Mega Man or Ninja Gaiden fan, you'll tear through the first quest in an hour or so. And that's right, I said first quest. Because after you beat this game, you're given a password to the second quest described as only for experts. And man, when they say experts, they aren't fucking around. The second quest on Metal Storm is some of the most brutal 2D action out there. Man, I used to be so good at this. Fuck. If a 10-year-old me could see this, he'd be crying right now. So yeah, this game is awesome, but why was it so overlooked? Well, my theory is I had a number of things against it, and it just never stood a chance. First off, it was released the same year as high-profile titles like Battletoads, Batman The Return of Joker, Tecmo Super Bowl, Double Dragon 3, and Bart vs. the Space Mutants. Not to mention that the Super Nintendo was only a few months away, but what probably did it was the fact that Irene just isn't high-profile enough. And I guess the cover of Nintendo Power could only do so much back then. But that doesn't explain why even today, it is still a criminally underrated game. As I've said, I've never seen Metal Storm honored in any of the myriad of top 10 or top 25 lists that you see in magazines all over the internet. It seems they're only concerned with the current underrated classics. And trust me, I'd love to be proven wrong. Well, in conclusion, we really do live in a great time. Modern consoles have given us countless classic gaming compilations over the years, and now we have the Wii and Virtual Console, and with it, we receive dozens of inexpensive old-school games every month. But, in spite of all this, I still see Metal Storm being completely forgotten. I mean, I really don't know what else to say at this point. I think I've said it all. Um, if you're a serious collector, or even a modest collector, you really owe it to yourself to have a copy of Metal Storm. Ah. Uh. So, in conclusion, this is the Happy Nerd saying, remember, there are way too many great video games out there to be so fucking angry all the time. Cheers.
Journey to Silius or Raft World is the best kind of old school 2D shooter. Like many of Sunsoft's famous 8 bit titles, everything about this game has a classic NES action feel. Long, difficult levels filled to the brim with pits, platforms, and wave after wave of enemies. Huge screen filling bosses, kick ass soundtrack, and a small arsenal of powerful weapons at your disposal. It's non stop NES action at its best. Sure, it does take its cues from Contra and Mega Man, but it all comes together so well. In short, Journey to Silius is almost nothing new, but almost everything perfect. So in Journey to Silius, you play as Jay. Um, Jay's father, who I think is some kind of space colonial engineer, is murdered by uh, terrorists. And you have to carry on with his work or something. And you decide to ignore that and instead go for revenge. I think. Fuck, it's not important. I don't really know what's going on in this game, and it's not important. I mean, this game is nearly 20 years old. It doesn't need to have a good story, okay? And it's not Sunsoft's fault that this game has a really confusing story. We'll get to that later. However, the game tried to have a good story, so I gave it a thumbs up for that. But if you've got a problem with it, just fucking hit start at the beginning, and you'll skip the story, and you won't have to worry about it. Pretend it's not there. Just get to the end of the level and don't die. The gameplay will be instantly familiar to anyone. You run, jump, and shoot your way through five increasingly difficult levels. If you are not an old school action veteran, this game will probably frustrate the hell out of you. It's not for beginners. In fact, unlike Metal Storm, I was terrible at this game when I was a kid. I couldn't beat it until I was like in high school. But man, beating a game that you couldn't beat as a kid, it's a great fucking feeling. The controls in this game are solid, but there is a surprising learning curve. And jumping and falling may seem needlessly difficult at first, but that's because Jay moves somewhat realistically, if you can believe that. For example, if you walk off an edge, the momentum of your walk stays with you once you become airborne and you will fall with an arc. This makes it nearly impossible just to fall straight down like a Mega Man. It's a subtle control quirk that makes Journey to Silius a little hard at first, and you may find yourself unintentionally falling on enemies you were trying to avoid. Jumping is another subtly difficult task. In a lot of 2D side-scrolling action games of this era, you have impossibly good control over your character's jump. But this is only half true with Journey to Silius. You can slow down your momentum in mid-air, but you cannot stop or change direction once you've left the ground. So pick your jumps wisely. I'd say it's a little more lenient than Castlevania, but a little more stiff than Contra. But this matches the overall, more realistic feel of Journey to Silius, and doesn't at all feel out of place. But I would never say this game's controls are too hard just unforgiving, don't get too cocky. But I also wouldn't say this game is easy either. It's going to take a bit of practice. This just shows the amount of detail that Sunsoft really put into this game. Now hands down, the best part of this game is the music. Five people are credited for the eight songs that appear in this game, and holy shit does it show. You know, I'm really surprised there haven't been more remixes of these songs. Remixers, are you looking for some untapped material? Journey to Silius is your new bandwagon. The world does not need another Mega Man or Final Fantasy remix. At the time I made this video, there was only one remix posted on Overclocked. Remixers, please get on this! So, gameplay, classic. Controls, solid. Music, fucking amazing. But the most interesting part of Journey to Silius? It's history. Did you know that Journey to Silius was originally developed as a game based on the first Terminator movie? It's true. There was a tiny article about it in Nintendo Power. And some remnants of the Terminator license are still in the game. Don't believe me? Well, check out this part of the intro music. And the last boss. Recognize him? I guess I would make this thing Skynet? I don't know. But Sunsoft lost their license and had to change the game. And this pretty much explains why the story doesn't make any sense. I mean, it was originally developed as a Terminator, they lost their license, and now they had to just make something up. So I don't blame them for having a shitty story. Which is really too bad, because had this game come out as the Terminator, Sunsoft would have been responsible for two great games based on popular movies. This and Batman. I mean, it would have been about as faithful, but I guarantee you it wouldn't have been forgotten. I mean, nobody forgets about that shitty T2 game that LJN made. Speaking of T2, I'm pretty sure that's why they lost their license. Journey to Silius was released on August of 1990, less than a year before T2 came out. Sunsoft was probably well into production on T1 when T2 was greenlit. The movie studio probably wanted to focus on hyping the sequel, and I don't blame them. They probably didn't want to waste any more time and money on the first one and strip Sunsoft of their license. But I guess we can be thankful that Sunsoft still took it upon themselves to finish the game without the Terminator license. Still, it's a shame. Well, I've done my part. Now don't forget, it's okay to be happy. Cheers.
in the past, I've done reviews of games I was sure that nobody had heard of. But Star Tropics is different. Star Tropics is a game I'm sure a lot of us know about and fondly remember. But it seems to have been completely forgotten. Like if you weren't there when it first came out, chances are you've never heard of this game, which is really a shame because it is easily one of the best games on the system. In fact, this game is so good, I don't think I can do it justice alone. So I've asked a friend of mine to help me out. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Neckbone. So what do you think, Neckbone? You ready to spread the good word of gaming or what? Neckbone! Neckbone! This one's got it all. Neckbone! Action, a long adventure, amazing graphics, catchy music, challenging puzzles, creative dungeons, hell. Neck! Even Rob makes a cameo. Bone! They really pull out all the stops here. Neckbone! The game even came with this awesome letter attached to the instruction book. And on it, there's actually a hidden solution in one of the game's puzzles. Just gotta get it wet. See that? Man, they don't make them like this anymore, do they? In Star Tropics, you play as Mike. Neckbone! Your Uncle Steve, a famous archaeologist, has gone missing and you're out to find him. Neckbone! You'll travel far and wide to a number of tropical islands Bone! and enter many dangerous dungeons in your search to find him. But all you need to know is you're essentially Link from Zelda, equipped with not a sword, but a yo-yo. And trust me, that's probably the coolest part of this game. Neckbone! And you may have never thought that a yo-yo could be badass, but Star Tropics will make you a believer. Neckbone! Now I'm not going to beat around the bush. This game ain't easy. Neckbone! The programmers are always trying to trick you, and there are little secrets and traps around every corner. Neck! It's an extremely clever game that's always one step ahead of you. Bow! Ah, damn it! Alright, Neckbone, wanna give it a shot? There you go. The controls take a little to get used to. Bow! You essentially move on a grid where you can't walk, jump, or attack diagonally. And this may seem stupid, but the entire game is built around this idea. Oh. So every room, puzzle, and enemy is intended to complement this design, and it does. Neckbone. It may seem awkward at first, Neck but if you stick with it, you will discover one of the most rewarding experiences on the NES. Star Tropics balance is perfect. Neckbone! Through the game's eight chapters, the difficulty never feels too hard, oh. and sure as hell it never feels too easy. Bow! Each new dungeon is harder than the last, and it forces you to constantly better yourself. Neckbone! And just when you think you can handle anything, the game throws another challenging enemy or puzzle your way. But the difficulty by no means hinders Star Tropics. If anything, it just makes victory more sweet. And who doesn't like a challenge? But it also assures you, you will not beat Star Tropics as quickly as lesser old school actioners. But don't worry, there are no passwords here, only saves, which is a great plus. But there are a few things about this game that did not age as well as the rest, and I feel I must address Star Tropics' few blemishes. One of the more annoying things is this forced story progression. Sometimes you cannot move on to the next area until you talk to everyone. But this isn't as tedious as you'd think, but it really does slow the game down. And for example, I know the solution to this puzzle, but I can't solve it yet because I haven't talked to the people who in the game tell me about the puzzle. But thankfully this only happens really in the first half of the game. But man is it ever annoying. And even though I complain, I don't think this really hurts Star Tropics. This kind of shit comes to the territory. Neck! You don't move next to an airport and then complain about the noise. Neck bone! And the sooner you accept that flaws like this are common among the old school, the sooner you can accept otherwise flawless classics like Star Tropics. Neck bone! Yeah, so I love this game. I have almost nothing but great things to say about it and cannot recommend it enough. But the same cannot be said for the sequel, Star Tropics 2, Zoda's Revenge. Yes, there was a sequel. Unfortunately, it wasn't very good. Oh. I mean, Zoda's Revenge wasn't bad on its own. Neck. But if you spent ample time with Star Tropics, Neck you'll see that it was a real half-assed sequel. I mean, the color palette was bland, the graphics only look marginally better, the music's more fitting for the Master System, and the gameplay just wasn't that much more of an improvement. Neck. Oh. It seems like for everything that was fixed, two things were broken. Star Tropics 2 deserved better. Neck bone! And Zoda's Revenge came out in 1994. It was actually the second to the last game officially published for the Nintendo. Bottom line, Star Tropics 2 should have been a Super Nintendo game. Bone! If Zoda's Revenge had come out on the Super Nintendo, it probably would have kicked ass and the series wouldn't have died off. I blame this painfully average sequel for killing the series. Neck bone! And another thing, there's a lot of shit on Virtual Console right now. China Warrior? Donkey Kong Jr. Math? If shit like this can make it on there, where the hell are good games like Star Tropics? 
This is not just a forgotten classic, it's a forgotten classic made by Nintendo themselves! Nintendo is ignoring their own game. There is no excuse for this title to be remain forgotten. If Ice Climbers and Kid Icarus can be brought back, why not Star Tropics? Well, alright. It's time to raise my glass and say goodbye. So remember, until next time, next it's time. Before Manhunt, or The Suffering, Carnival, Shadow Man, Nightmare Creatures, Loaded, Blood, Mortal Kombat, or Doom, there was Splatterhouse. Arguably the first good violent horror themed video game. Not the first, but the first good. In 1988, Namco made video game history when Splatterhouse was unleashed in the arcades. It spawned one port, two incredible sequels, and a spin-off. Splatterhouse was dark. Splatterhouse was violent. Splatterhouse was graphic, gory, and bloody. Splatterhouse was an amazing video game series that has not received the credit it deserves. It is without question one of the most criminally underrated video game series ever. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute pleasure to bring to you a retrospective of one of my all-time favorite video game series, Splatterhouse. The hero of Splatterhouse is Rick, one of the hardest badasses of all video games. Rick will stop at nothing, and I mean nothing, to rescue his loved ones from the clutches of evil. Look at this, prime example. When a knife is thrown at Rick, what does he do? Fucking punches it, that's what. I mean, when was the last time you punched a knife, fist to blade, and it was the knife that lost? Yeah, that's never happened, because you ain't as badass as Rick. Rick will fuck you up. But what makes him such a badass is his mask. Sometimes referred to as the Terror Mask, which is simply the mask, this ancient Mayan relic gives Rick the superhuman strength he needs to save his loved ones. But is this mask a blessing or a curse? <laughs> and this is a good time to point out that Splatterhouse does pay homage to a lot of horror movies, most notably Friday the 13th. The Terror Mask is white throughout all the games, with the exception of the American TurboGrafx port where it was red. The mask started off rather plain looking, more like a hockey mask, but as the series progressed, it was reshaped to resemble more of a skull. But this doesn't really cover up the obvious influence of Jason Voorhees' signature look. Other references include Evil Dead 2, The Deadly Spawn, and Poltergeist. My point is, Splatterhouse is a game made for horror fans by horror fans. There are four games in the Splatterhouse series. Part 1 came out in the arcade in 1988 and was ported to the TurboGrafx and PC Engine two years later. Parts 2 and 3 came out on the Sega Genesis in 1992 and 93 respectively. And this cutesy SD spin-off Wampaku Graffiti was released only in Japan for the Famicom. This chibi Japanese exclusive is more of a quirky side story, and in the interest of keeping things focused, this video will only stick to the main three games. Though I will recommend it to importers. Alright, let's get started. According to the instruction book, Rick and Jennifer are parapsychology majors. Because I guess parapsychology also means paranormal, they went to visit Dr. West, a famous parapsychologist's mansion, which had been given the nickname, The Splatter House. However, when they arrive, Rick is knocked unconscious by some unseen assailant and is left for dead while Jennifer is captured. But none of this is actually covered in either version of the game. I mean, in the arcade, there was a little movie in the beginning showing the mask floating above Rick's dead body and then attaching itself to his face. So I guess that kind of explains where the mask came from. But this is all left out of the TurboGrafx version. It's completely open. And that really frustrated me, but we'll get to that later. As you can see, Splatterhouse is a stripped down 2D beat em up. And this may appear a little primitive, and it is. But you say primitive, I say classic. Because Namco mixes things up and keeps things from really feeling stale. There's danger coming at you not just from in front of you, but from the background, from the floor, and flying above you. The level design's always new and fresh. And this one can be tough. You rarely have any time to really breathe. And some levels have a less linear approach where you can choose your own path, though all paths lead to the same boss. And the boss battles are always a new challenge. They start out kind of easy and quickly get hard. There's always a new surprise waiting for you at the end of each level. 
One of the really unique things the first Splatterhouse brought to the table was the creative use of weapons. Look at that! Classic! It ain't called Splatterhouse for nothing, folks. And really, when was the last time you saw a game this old use a shotgun with such brutal realism? That's video game history. Now, you can't talk about the TurboGrafx port of Splatterhouse without talking about the differences between it and the arcade. Most notable are the color of the mask and the fourth level boss. In the arcade version, you fight a flying inverted cross in a church. And in the TurboGrafx version, you fight another evil mask in some vacant hallway. The funny thing is, in both versions, a church hymn is played after you defeat the boss. But in the TurboGrafx version, all the religious imagery was taken out, so the song makes no sense. Other things include an altogether more toned down experience, but I don't think this had much to do with censorship, but hardware limitations. The TurboGrafx-16 really wasn't that powerful, and as a result, we lost a lot of nice, gory level decorations and extra animations, but the gameplay was left completely intact, so this is only a minor gripe. The highlight of the first game, and maybe this series, is a boss fight you encounter towards the end of the game. You finally find your girlfriend, but only to discover that she's immutated into some horrible, bloodthirsty monster. And now it's you or her. Somebody's going to die. Either Jennifer kills her boyfriend, or Rick kills his girlfriend. Wow. That's fucked up. That is cruel, disturbing, vile, and great fucking storytelling. No, I'm serious. This goes down on my list as like one of the best video game plot twists ever. And the creepiest thing is hearing Jennifer say during her last few fleeting moments when she reverts back to human. She doesn't want to kill you. That's not her choice anymore. And it's moments like these that make you fall in love with these games, as there's disturbing little twists throughout the entire series, especially in the third one. But that's one of the best things about Splatterhouse. It has a great story. And that's not something that can be said about most games, even today. But this ends up being one of my biggest gripes of this game. There wasn't much of it. The potential for a great story was so grand that I was disappointed when I wasn't given one. Like, what the fuck is actually going on here? What happened to Jennifer? And after, what happened to Rick? And the mask? How did Rick find the mask? Or, I guess more accurately, how or why did the mask find Rick? And what's going on with this house? Why is all this crazy shit happening? Is it possessed? Or is it the product of some misguided science? I mean, I don't normally complain about an old school game having a lack of story, but this one would have benefited so much by having a fully realized narrative. And we never really get all the answers either. But this is a problem that was addressed in the sequels. Speaking of which... In 1992, the Sega Genesis received a brand new original chapter in the Splatterhouse series. And with it, we got graphics that gave the arcade a run for its money, some of the best music on the Genesis, more gore, a longer adventure, and an actual attempt at some story. Splatterhouse 2 represents everything a sequel should be, and really what the TurboGrafx 1 should have been. Of the three, Part 2 is my favorite. I'd say Splatterhouse 2 is a lot like Evil Dead 2, and by that I mean it's both a sequel and a remake. I mean, the box itself says, it begins again. It took everything that was great about Part 1 and improved upon it. The same simplified 2D gameplay is still here, but now there's more emphasis on platforming elements and a little more variety in your enemies. The controls are as tight as ever, and combat this simple never felt so awesome. Seriously, hit stuff with long blunt objects has never been more fun. Oh, and there's a chainsaw in this one too. The setting is three months after the first one, but the mask has convinced Rick to come back to the house and save Jennifer. But you killed Jennifer in part one, right? Why are you going back to rescue her? She's dead. So I guess that wasn't really Jennifer after all. And didn't the house burn down at the end? Is this the mansion from The Shining? And Dr. West, the scientist who I guess is to blame for all this, is never mentioned. Now we have this new guy, Dr. Mueller. And we actually see him in the game. Ha! Fucker. But at least Namco realized the potential this game had, so I give them marks for trying to give the game a decent narrative. One thing I don't think anyone can argue is that Splatterhouse 2 had the best music. So big up to... Milky Aiko? Milky? Milky? Well, whatever. Whatever the name, they did a fantastic job making Part 2 tense and spooky. The music complements the visuals very well and gives the game a nice, creepy atmosphere. Splatterhouse 2 has got a specific kind of difficulty that you rarely see in games, even today. If you've played Contra Shattered Soldier or Super Ghouls and Ghosts, then you know what I'm talking about. 
If you know where to stand, what to hit, and when to hit it, you can tear through this game without ever getting touched. In other words, it's the kind of game that's easy when you know how. In my prime, I could go through part two on the hardest difficulty level, rarely if ever getting hit. So don't give me no crap about this game being too hard. You'll get no sympathy from me. And you know, the fact that this game even exists is pretty amazing. You would have never seen anything this graphic on a Nintendo console back in the 90s. In fact, really graphic games as a whole weren't seen much back then. Part 2 was one of the few, if not the only Genesis game to have a warning on the box before the rating system was implemented. And I don't know about you, but that just made me want to play the game more. So when Splatterhouse 2 ends, Rick saves Jennifer and everything's just cherry. With all this behind them, Rick and Jennifer get married, buy a house, have a son, and live happily ever after. Part 2 is pretty much just an advancement over the ideas set in Part 1, but Part 3 was a complete reinvention of the series from the ground up. And that's why- wait, what's going on? Oh, making fun of him too? No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Splatterhouse 3 was the most different of the bunch, and it had its strengths and weaknesses. First, its strengths. Gone is that old one-plane, two-dimensional approach. Part 3 has more in common with Final Fight and Streets of Rage than it does with the first two. And this is a smart move, because I don't think Namco could have outdone themselves. I mean, as far as that type of game goes, Part 2 is about as good as it gets. Part 3 also introduces a completely non-linear level design. Every level has a destination, but how you get there is all up to you. This was a nice, refreshing change of pace and a unique spin on the 2D brawlers. But you still must choose your path wisely. In each level you have a timer, and if you take too long, terrible things will happen. I mean, you could ignore the timer and just explore, but honestly, there isn't much to see. And besides, that's a one-way ticket to the worst ending. And that's right, Splatterhouse 3 had multiple endings, which means it had story. Tons of story. Each chapter had a new reason to race against the clock, and with four different endings, Splatterhouse was finally given the story it deserved. And some extra replay value, too. And the way they achieved this was so simple. Rick must hurry through the levels before his wife is eaten or his son is sacrificed in some godless ritual. It's a genius way to establish a motive, and it makes this the most nerve-wracking of the bunch. Fuck no! Fucking get up, get up, hurry, come on! But Splatterhouse 3 had a few balancing issues that I felt really helped the game back. And because of this, I have to say that Part 3 is my least favorite of the bunch. The combat system is really shallow, and the game is just too unforgiving at times. It almost punishes you for trying to get good at the combo system, and encourages you to just be cheap. Later in the game, enemies become way too strong and can kill you in two hits, so you have to resort to special moves to make it in time. I mean, the spinning kick is a difficult move to do, and it takes some practice to be able to pull it off consistently, but once you've got that down, the game becomes kind of boring. And there was a serious lack of weapons in this game. I mean, there are weapons, but if you get hit, they get taken away. What the fuck? This just adds to the frustration because you need weapons to beat some of the levels and bosses in time. This game had a ton of great ideas, but the combat system just completely botched the game for me. But stepping outside the Splatterhouse universe, Part 3 is a great game among the 2D brawlers. I mean, I don't think any of them were as non-linear, story-driven, or gory as this one. So as a brawler fan, I highly recommend it. But as a Splatterhouse fan, I think you can do better. But that's just how I feel. My research tells me that I'm actually in the minority on this, as Part 3 is widely considered to be the best one of the bunch. So, whatever. To each their own. So there you go, my retrospective on the three-part Splatterhouse series. But, before we go, I still have a few fanboy things I want to talk about, starting with... God, how cool would a remake be? You know what I gotta say, one thing about these games is, despite all its graphic content, you never kill humans or people. All you ever do in these games is kill demons and ghouls and zombies and the like. I mean, parents groups and politicians would really have nothing to complain about. I mean, I can see what's wrong with killing a human with a chainsaw, but what's so bad about killing a ghoul with a chainsaw? I mean, the only other human beings in these games are the people you're trying to save. That's wholesome family values right there. I mean, Rick could have been like, fuck you people, you're on your own, I ain't going in there. But instead, he rolls up his sleeves, picks up a 2x4, and does what any good boyfriend or husband or father should do. See? 
family values. God, how cool would a remake be? And the reason why I bring up this idea of a remake is because I know Namco hasn't forgot about Splatterhouse. Over the years, they've made little references to our favorite little game. The most recent is this song in the soundtrack of Katamari Damashi. It's actually a reworking of the ending theme from the first one. Come on, Namco, quit screwing with us. I know there aren't many of us, but some of us have been waiting for over a decade for more Splatterhouse. Please, Namco, either remake the game or just stop teasing us. Well, if I haven't convinced you yet, these are games you need to try. I don't know what else to say. If you like a little violence and gore sometimes, I cannot recommend the Splatterhouse games enough. And with that, I guess we come to the end. Ah. I want to wish everyone a safe and happy Halloween. This is the Happy Nerd saying, go have fun. Cheers. I don't need to tell you that there are dozens and dozens of underrated action games on the Super Nintendo. Because of this little guy, we will never be short of games to review. And with this in mind, let me tell you about a little game called Wild Guns. I chose this game not only because it is nearly flawless and extremely underrated, but because it is a rare type of action game you hardly ever saw during the 16-bit era, or really ever. There are only a handful of games like Wild Guns, and I can't imagine why that is. The only other titles that come to my mind were the arcade games Cabal and its decent NES port, its unofficial sequel Blood Brothers, and the Neo Geo game Nom 1975. And if memory serves me right, Wild Guns is the best game of its kind. It stands as one of the greatest action games on the Super Nintendo. Natsume's Wild Guns is an action game truly greater than the sum of its parts. It's serious fun. Question. What's better than Cowboys and Indians? Cowboys and Robots! That's what... I don't know who came up with the concept for this game, but they're a fucking genius. The Old West? Versus massive science fiction robots? Hell yeah! That alone makes this one of the coolest games ever. Wild Guns stars Annie, a woman as deadly as she is beautiful. And Clint, a man as dangerous as he is unshaven. There is story, but it's just some filler about bounty hunters and revenge and, and who cares? I sure as fuck don't. If I wanted a good story, I'd watch a movie, or read a book, or play Journey to Silius. I'm playing Wild Guns, the game where cowboys armed with automatic weapons shoot at giant robots. As I'm sure you've noticed, this game is furious in unrelenting action. Things for you to shoot and to shoot back are never in short supply. This is made all the more fun by its destructible environments. Undoing millions of years worth of geological formation has never been more fun. Now just by looking at this game, it may seem like it'd be impossible to keep an eye on everything at once, and honestly it would be, if not for an inclusion of an extremely helpful warning system. Whenever a bullet is headed your way, a little speech bubble pops up by your character. That way stray bullets don't sneak up on you as often as they could. This is a godsend, and a sign of smart, clever game design. This also allows the game to deliver amazing, over-the-top action without being too hard or frustrating. And if things get too hot, just nuke them. Yeah, Contra 3 has got nothing on that shit. One of the most important aspects of any action game is how much it makes you feel like a badass. And Wild Guns is no slouch in this department. And I'm not just talking about single-handedly taking down towering mechs or enormous flamethrowing tanks. Oh no, it gets much better. <laughs> Down at the bottom of the screen you will notice a gauge, and when it is full, it not only makes you invincible but unleashes the most powerful gun in the game, the Vulcan Cannon. This thing gives words like dominating, unstoppable, juggernaut, and very fucking satisfying a whole new meaning. But how you fill up your power gauge is actually quite clever. 
by shooting enemy bullets. Seems easy enough, but this will lead to you feeling cocky and gambling with your life. Here's how a typical situation is played out. Your lookout warning pops up, signifying that a bullet is heading your way. Now you have two options. Either dive out of the way, or shoot it and fill up your power gauge. But, you have to do some quick math in your head. Can I get my crosshair over there in time before the bullet hits me? This will lead to many unnecessary and otherwise easily avoidable deaths. But, any game that exploits the flaws of mankind in order to make its balance better is okay in my book. Now because the action in this game is so intense and fun, you might not even notice how amazing the music is. Do yourself a favor and head to the options menu and check out the sound test. You'll find yourself some rockin' tunes, trust me. Actually, this game wouldn't be anywhere near as exciting without the music. See? Yeah, there we go, that's what I'm talking about. Wild Guns owes a lot to its soundtrack. It's just another amazing layer of awesome. So, unique and intense action, Totally rad setting, badass weapons and bosses, all tied together with the beautiful graphics, tight controls, and a pulse pounding soundtrack? I know what you're saying. What's the catch? Well... I know this sounds too good to be true, but the only bad thing I can say about this one is that it's a little short, and kinda easy by my standards. I'd say you can have this game beaten and mastered in a weekend or a dedicated afternoon. This was the perfect Friday night rental. But then again, I'd argue that the same could be said about other great actioners, like Contra 3, Axelay, or Super Metro. The ride may be short, but it's one hell of a ride. And it's a game that you'll play once, love, and then forget, only to rediscover and then fall in love with all over again a year or two later. Like I said earlier, Wild Guns is a rare type of action game, and I think now would be a great time for a revival. You really never saw this type of game, but with the Wii and the DS, I think it could be done very well. Like moving with the control pad, and then shooting with the remote or the stylus. And I'm not talking about games like Resident Evil The Umbrella Chronicles or Time Crisis 4. I mean, those are like a first-person shooter. This is like a fixed third-person shooter. This type of game I think would be great on modern consoles. Hmm. Just a thought. Alright, gang. That's it for now. But remember, this is the happy nerd saying... No! You know what? No. Because cowboys don't drink wine. They drink whiskey! Oh, yeah. So, till next time. As human beings, we love nostalgia. When we're not pining for the good old days of our youth, we're somehow trying to beat time at its own game and make ourselves younger. And while like most healthy adults, I have accepted my adulthood. But I still hold very dear the days of my childhood. I don't know about you, but when I was seven, I couldn't wait for Friday after school. When I had two whole days to play with my toys, draw pictures, watch cartoons, and of course, play Nintendo. Playing retro games for me is like taking a time warp back to my adolescence, but no game embodies the essence of what it feels like to be a seven-year-old boy again, like Capcom's Little Nemo, the Dream Master. A game where you get to be a bee, a frog, a fish, a mole? Travel through mushroom forests, swim through night oceans, fly to a ruined city in the clouds and dash through a house of toys? And use a magical scepter to thwart darkness and save a princess? Sounds like the product of a typical seven-year-old's imagination to me. This game's greatest feature is its undeniable charm, and while I can say that there are many games that take me back to the past, few truly make me feel like a kid again. 
It's the type of game you'll want to play on a Saturday morning still in your pajamas. To borrow the tagline from Wes Anderson's Life Aquatic, Little Nemo the Dream Master. This is an adventure. It is the year 1909, and our hero Nemo is sleeping soundly one night in his New York home. That night, he is awakened in his room by a strange woman, who extends an invitation by Camille, the Princess of Slumberland, to be her playmate. Like any seven-year-old boy, Nemo is at first hesitant to go and play with a girl. But after receiving the gift of candy, he agrees to come, as long as he doesn't have to kiss her. And that's pretty much it for the story. And that's all this game really needs. I mean, one of the great things about this game is that it never tries to be more than it needs to be. A fairy tale. There are many unique things about this game that set it apart from the rest. One is that the goal is not just to get to the end of the level. You must scour each huge world and find all the keys to unlock a door. This means levels are less linear, with branching paths and hidden passages to explore. This design was very uncommon for games back then. But most keys are hidden in places too high or too small for anyone to get to. This is where your candy comes into play. Around the level there are many nice creatures. These creatures will not attack you, but if you feed them candy, they'll let you ride them. This idea is kind of similar to Mega Man, because each creature has a special power and you must use each of them to find the keys in the level. And as levels get harder, they also get bigger, and you are forced to become more resourceful with the animals available to you. Now, if all this sounds weird and therefore dumb to you, you're sort of missing the point. Yes, Little Nemo is very different, and all this may sound like a dumb concept for a game, but then, you're not really thinking like a seven-year-old. The strange environment, surreal setting, and fairy tale like story all fit perfectly when framed in the imagination of a child. And once again, it is this undeniable charm that makes Little Nemo one of the most enjoyable gaming experiences ever. Now, this isn't exactly a kid's game, or at least not what you'd think of as a kid's game today. This game is hard. Deceptively hard. In fact, this one is more for the adult gamer who's still a kid at heart. The concept and environment are all very cutesy, but don't let that fool you. This one will have you screaming at the TV, shouting bad words your mother told you to never say. Fucking shit! Derek! Sorry, Mom. Wait, what are you doing in my apartment? Uh, so, okay, alright, yeah. There are a couple things about Little Nemo that make it really hard. For example, even the friendly animals can hurt you, some levels have no checkpoints, the candy is really your only weapon and you can't kill anything with it, and when riding certain animals you cannot attack at all. But it's these little fuckers that take the cake. The float fiends. If you've never played this game, you simply have no idea what frustration truly means. Just imagine, if you will, the birds from Ninja Gaiden coupled with the unrelenting respawn time of the Medusa heads from Castlevania, and you have one of the most infuriating enemies in video game history. The only way to get rid of them is either to kill them or let them float to the bottom of the screen. This means you can't outrun them. If you run to the left or to the right, they just follow you. They won't leave you alone. And right when one leaves the screen, another one immediately spawns to take its place. They're just so fucking unrelenting. You will hate these things. God, this game is hard. And you know what? I'm glad. This is a real game. There were no kids games when I grew up. Hell, I grew up on games like this. Contra, Mega Man, Castlevania, Journey to Silius, Star Tropics, hard games. And you learn life lessons from these games. You learn what hard work and determination can do and what a real challenge was. None of this soft, ratchet and clank shit. They weren't afraid to give us a challenging game back then. And you know what? They're better games because of it. I can still go back and play them today because they're not some watered down, don't want to hurt the kids self-esteem shit. Real games were real hard, just like real life. Now in terms of how this game looks, sounds, and feels, well, see for yourself. Capcom was arguably the greatest third-party developer on the NES, and Little Nemo is just one of many titles that feature striking graphics, super tight controls, and awesome music. So, if you're familiar with any of Capcom's titles from this era, you know what to expect. 
So even with its steep difficulty and frustrating parts, Little Nemo is still a fantastic NES classic. Its soundtrack, graphics, story, and setting all come together to give the game an undeniable charm. This game captures the feeling of the limitless bounds of a child's imagination, much like Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. And this game is yet another with a truly fascinating history, so get ready to learn something. Little Nemo the Dream Master is actually based on an animated Japanese film called Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. It shared both American and Japanese directors and producers, but was made in Japan. An interesting fact is that even though Vampire Hunter D was the first anime conceived with an American release in mind, and Akira was the first anime given a theatrical run in America, Little Nemo was the first Japanese cartoon to be given a national theatrical run in America, where it garnered critical acclaim. In spite of this, however, the film failed to be profitable in theaters and sank into obscurity, which is really a shame because it has some of the greatest non-Disney, non-Miyazaki hand-drawn animation I've ever seen. And the English voice acting ain't half bad, especially with the scene-stealing voice work of Mickey Rooney as a voice of Flip. Another noteworthy fact is that Nancy Cartwright, famous for the voice of Bart Simpson, has a small cameo in the film, and it is her character that appears in the intro of the NES game. So, when you watch that intro, just imagine that's Jay Sherman's sister talking. When Adventures in Slumberland came to VHS, it was trimmed, probably to make it an easier sell for the children's home movie market. The VHS runs a little over 80 minutes, whereas the theatrical and DVD cut run at just over 100 minutes. This makes sense, since just like the game, the movie is more for adults, still very much in touch with their inner child and not really for kids. I find it doubtful that most kids could sit through the entire 100 minute DVD. And speaking of the DVD, Adventures in Slumberland had a very limited run and has been out of print for years and now goes for anywhere between 50 to 100 dollars. The VHS and Laserdisc go for much less, but who wants those old things? And interesting still, the movie and the game are all based on American artist Windsor McKay's groundbreaking surrealist comic Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland, which ran in newspapers like the New York Herald and New York American from 1905 to 1913. So interesting and influential was his life and work, I simply didn't know where to begin when I prepared this review. Suffice to say, the life and work of Windsor McKay, whose stunning animation work predates the heyday of Disney by some 20 years, is truly fascinating, and if you have any interest in entertainment history, art, comics, or animation, I encourage you to look him up. He was pretty much the Bill Watterson of his time. Because his work is so old, it's all public domain, so head to your favorite search engine and learn something about one of America's greatest forgotten entertainers. Okay gang, well, that's it for this episode. I leave you now with the words of Mr. Tom Stoppard. If you carry your childhood with you, you will never become old. Cheers. Pajamas playing video games? No, Mom. Derek, are you still in your pajamas playing video games? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that should be good. <laughs> All right, cool. That's it, Mom. <laughs> Let it go. I gotta get you on camera, though. Just the eyes, please. <laughs> come, on, come here, come here. Turn us around. See? It's me for the DVD. This is my actual mom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks. Nightshade.
You heard of this one? Let's go. You've never played a game quite like Nightshade. And no, I don't mean that shitty sequel to that shitty remake of Shinobi for the PS2. I'm talking about the first Nightshade, the swan song title from Ultra Games for the NES. It's hard to describe what exactly Nightshade is, but imagine a game with a present day setting that is one part King's Quest, one part Maniac Mansion, mixed with a little bit of Street Fighter 2 and Earthworm Jim. And that's pretty much Nightshade. If you're still lost, just know it's by far one of the most ambitious and creative titles on the NES. It isn't perfect, but the fact that this game's many pieces work as well as they do makes this game more than noteworthy. Nightshade is an amazing achievement for the NES, and not only have you probably never heard of it, you've never played anything quite like it. Enter the crime-torn streets of Metro City. There was a time when these streets were safe and welcomed citizens of all walks of life. But that was before the city's protector, Vortex, fell at the hands of criminal mastermind, Sutek. Now Metro City is in dire need of a new savior. A person with the courage and bravery to take a stand, to fight back, and take back this troubled metropolis from the clutches of evil. That person is Nightshade. Wow, what a guy! I'd love to meet him in person. <laughs> Holy shit, Lampshade! Nightshade! Holy shit, Nightshade! Oh my god, I can't believe this is my own house! Nightshade! Night fucking shade! Knock it off! Stop ripping off James, you no talent sack of shit! Where's that goddamn neck bone? Ow! There he is! Oh shit! You ruined the Star Trappers review! I, I, you I, stupid suck! Nice shade, nice shade, man! What? What? what are you doing? Man, what are you doing? Acting happy, drinking wine, and playing games all the time. Nobody plays games and drinks wine, you f But Nice Shade, I'm reviewing your game. I'm reviewing it because it's really good. And be honest, when was the last time anybody was talking about Nice Shade? Oh, um, that's fine, I guess. But why can't you do your own thing? Why do you have to rip people off way more talented than you? Oh, well, because I'm lazy and I have no talent. But Nightshade, listen, the angry nerd is not going to review your game. I'm the only one looking out for you, man. That's not true. What about Little Miss Gamer? Wait, well, yeah, that's true. But listen, Nightshade, you're here. Why don't you help me out with the review? Okay, what do you say? All right. At least James is funny. Oh, you're right. Well, let's do this. We don't have to. No. We could. No. We don't. Let's, we did. No. Yeah. Okay. Don't. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, Join me on that. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. What's this? this is where I. Oh. The, really? The whole magic thing. This. Yeah. Oh. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's get back to the review. To give you an idea how unique this game is, I'll give you a quick walkthrough of the first few minutes. Supervillain Sutek has tied our hero to a chair next to a bomb, armed and ready to explode. To escape while avoiding harm, Nightshade must quickly find cover and safely wait for the bomb to detonate before moving to the conveniently placed candle to let the fire burn through his ropes. Then, after some clever investigation, our hero finds his way outside of the building and into the heart of the crime-ridden city. And from there, Metro City becomes your playground. You're not really given any specific direction, but trust me, this is a good thing. Half the fun of this game is just exploring the city and trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. You can rescue cats, visit the library, check out the ladies' changing room, save citizens in peril, or don't. It's all up to you. Hell, just exploring the ins and outs of the city will take you about a half hour, and this is an 8-bit Nintendo game we're talking about here. And unlike games like Dr. Chaos and Castlevania 2, it'll take you a long time to exhaust every idea and become hopelessly stuck. Truth be told, you will probably need a guide to help you through all the way to the end, but even when you know exactly where to go, there's still so much to see and do. Really, for an original 8-bit Nintendo title, this is about as rich of an experience you could ask for. You know, Nightshade, some people don't like this game. Really? Yeah. Like who? Some people on the internet. Fuck you. It's... One of the highlights of Nightshade is the dialogue. Specifically, the super cheesy jokes and painfully corny puns. There are stupid jokes everywhere. This game is fucking hilarious. 
and if you're a fan of stupid humor done right, you'll agree. There's so many jokes in this game, there's something to laugh at on literally every screen. Nightshade is always describing something in a humorous way, or saying something so painfully dumb you can't help but groan and laugh at the same time. Nearly everything that comes out of a hero's mouth is so deliciously bad. Cool! What a great great! My great great grandfather had a great that was greater than this though. Great! Mm, that was pretty great. So not only is this one of the most unique games in the NES, it's also the funniest. Sorry, Maniac Mansion. So there's all these mini side quests and things to do in the city, but is there actually a point to them? Well, yeah! Right next to your health meter you will notice something called a popularity meter. Every time you do a good deed or beat up a bad guy, it fills up a little. And this allows you to actually get to new places and new people recognize you, and you need to actually fill this bar up to get to certain parts in the game. It's nothing too special, but it's a really cool feature and something I think entirely unique to this game. Still not convinced this game is awesomely unique? How about this? Instead of having lives, every time you die, you are captured by Sutek and put in a different James Bond-like trap. If you escape, you get to keep playing. If not, then it's game over. Each trap is like a mini puzzle, but once you die enough times, you're put in a trap that you can't escape from, so it's not like we have unlimited lives or anything. And even though you'll probably figure out all the solutions to Sutex traps within the first hour or so, you can't deny that this is a really cool idea. Again, I'm just a sucker for how creative and unique this game is. So, do you like my Star Tropics video? I liked him. Except for oh. the damp. I liked him. But this game has a few big problems. A clunky menu system where you have to deal with a tedious examining process and item management rears its ugly head in to remind you just how old this game is. Because of this, I can only recommend this one to gamers who are truly down with retro games. Interacting with your environment can seem like a real chore, and unless you're really a retro gamer, you probably won't be able to forgive this archaic system. But if you still think games like Snatchers, Shadowgate, and Deja Vu are fun, you'll feel right at home. If those games bore you, Nightshade might not be for you, because unlike those games, Nightshade is far more interactive since you have complete control over your character. So one could argue that you may have hated Snatcher, perish the thought, but still enjoy Nightshade. Nightshade is by no means a terrible game, but add this with the fact that there are no passwords or save points, and it just might not be your thing. Another problem is the combat. It's kinda lame. There's a big lack of balance here. Some fights are stupid easy and others are really, really tough. You don't have a whole lot of fighting moves, Nightshade. Well, I'm just an average guy, what do you want? But you're an action star in the game. Well, I don't have a utility belt. But you're like a superhero. All you do is uppercut. Well, that's a start. This is still unlike any other game on the NES, so I can't really hold it against the game. And if memory serves me right, it's better than TMNT Tournament Fighters, which was the only domestic fighting game for the NES that I can think of. It's not completely broken, but it could be better. I still feel Ultra Games deserves credit for Nightshade's fighting system. This game just crams in so much. It tries to be so many different things, and for the most part, it succeeds on all fronts. It's not perfect, but for what they had to work with, I'd say they did fantastic. Nightshade is a game clearly ahead of its time, and I hate to sound redundant, but this would have kicked so much ass on the Super NES. And what's this? The game is subtitled Part 1? Does this mean they had other ideas in store for a sequel, but never had the chance to make it? Man, Nightshade Chapter 2 on the SNES? Where do I sign? Actually, I'd say it's just as likely this is another corny joke. Like, how pretentious is it for a game to have a Part 1 in its title? The idea that a game company would be so presumptuous that their game would reach the financial merit of a sequel while they were still making it is absolutely absurd. Yeah, this is probably a joke on the fact that they were sure nobody was going to play this one. And with a 1991 release, this was the typical fate of a high-quality, low-profile game for the NES. <sighs> what a shame. Well, Nightshade, that about does it. This is part of the video now. I'd like to raise my glass and have a bit of wine. Care to join me? No, superheroes don't drink, especially when they're on duty. Wow. Okay, well, until next time, gang, remember, good games are great because they're good. What?!
Rocket Knight Adventures may not be the most underrated game of all time, but its main character Sparkster is easily one of the most underrated video game characters of all time. Sparkster and Rocket Knight Adventures were born in the early 90s, after Sonic became a household name and every gaming company in the business is trying to cash in on his success and create a badass mascot of their very own. And while most of these animal game mascots and their respective titles are best left forgotten, there's at least one that shouldn't be. And that of course is Sparkster in his first game, Rocket Knight Adventures. What makes this game great is not so much its concept, but its execution. The game design has a staggering amount of variety and balance that feels familiar but never redundant. It's far from the most difficult game out there, but beginners will probably run out of continues before they see the credits roll. The artistic design is so rich with characters and environments, I wouldn't be surprised if there were plans for an anime or a Saturday morning cartoon. Throw in a unique little gimmick, perfect controls, a fun, catchy soundtrack, and you've got one solid package. So, even though Sparkster was just a ripoff trying to cash in on Sonic the Hedgehog, that doesn't change the fact that Rocket Knight Adventures is still one of the finest games in the Genesis and one of the finest action platformers of the 16-bit era. Sparkster is a possum. Or a possum. A possum. Not possum? What's the difference? Anyway. This may sound ridiculous, but then again, we've accepted the idea of a bandicoot and a lombax as video game characters, so why not an opossum? Or possum. A possum. A possum. But that's not why we love Sparkster. The reason Sparkster is so endearing is he's given so much character. Not only does he just look cool with his goggles, armor, and jetpack, he's genuinely well animated and fun to control. He's given a whole range of emotions, faces, sound effects, and the motherfucker's just cute. Oh, adorable. Not to mention that word on the street is he's a sucker for a good chili dog. Don't forget the peppers. At the time, Sparkster was a welcome change of pace from all the Sonic imitators because he wasn't trying to be some badass with a bad attitude. One thing Sparkster had over all the others was a more traditional, timeless look. Sparkster is still just as awesome now as he was back in 93. Just look at him. He's a knight with a jetpack. You, you can't, can't top that! Man, I wish that t-shirt offer was still good. But it's not just our hero that's fun to look at. The entire world of Rocket Knight Adventures is so well conceived and animated. I go as far as to say that it houses some of the greatest and most memorable graphics on the Genesis. All of the environments, enemies, and bosses have a level of polish to them that really makes the look of this game shine. It's one of the few Genesis games that truly gave the graphically superior Super Nintendo a run for its money. Now allow me to backpedal for just a minute here. We were talking about the mascot craze in the 90s and all the shitty games that came about, but there's definitely one game I really want to talk about. There's this terrible, terrible Genesis game called, and I'm not joking, Awesome Possum kicks Dr. Machino's butt. Which may be the most radically stupid video game title ever. Awesome Possum kicks Dr. Machino's butt? God, that's awful. Now I've never actually played this game, but just by looking at it, I can tell this is one of the worst video game mascots in my pick for the worst game title ever. But then again, I've never actually played it. So, if there's any video game reviewers out there, angry video game reviewers out there, who want to give this game a shot, I'd be more than interested to see how terrible this game probably is. Because that's just not my department. Speaking of which, back to the good shit. The gameplay of Rocket Knight Adventures feels like a greatest hits collection of classic action platforming. Each of the game's seven levels is divided up into different stages and boss fights, each of them feeling like a different classic action platformer you've played before. And this isn't surprising when you realize the game was designed by Nobuya Nakazato, who made Contra titles like Alien Wars for the Super Nintendo, Hardcore for the Genesis, and a personal favorite of mine, Shattered Soldier for the PS2. But unlike Mr. Nakazato's other titles, which are among some of the most difficult games of all time, Rocket Knight Adventures is not really that tough. Well, not on its default difficulty, which is actually easy. But if you want a challenge, you can play this game on hard, where you start with no lives, everything kills you in one hit, and you have no continues. 
That's right, you pretty much have to beat the whole game without ever getting hit. Which puts the American Splatterhouse 2's Game Master difficulty to absolute shame. At least there you got two hits. Ah, so good. And it's on Virtual Console now. Oh, sorry. So I've been talking a lot about how Rocket Knight Adventures is similar to other classics you might be familiar with, but I don't want to give you the impression that there isn't much unique about this game, trust me. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is something you've probably noticed about Sparkster that I haven't mentioned yet. His jetpack. He is a Rocket Knight after all. This little gimmick was really what made this game unique. Simply hold down the A or C button, wait for your meter to fill up, and release. You can shoot in all eight directions, which will launch you until you hit an enemy, ricochet off a wall, or run out of power. Or you can just release while standing still. I really like the way the developers handled this. You're forced to use the jetpack a lot less than you'd think. You can get through large portions of the game without ever really using it, but if you experiment, you can discover ways to beat levels faster and bosses easier. It's a game that rewards you for being creative, and I like that in a game. Another awesome thing is even though Sparkster shoots energy from a sword, getting close enough to enemies to actually hit them with the blade of your sword does considerably more damage. Some bosses can be taken out in record time if you stand just right, but they'll whip your ass just as fast if you get too cocky. It's a good risk-reward system that flourishes thanks to perfect hit detection and perfect controls. It's the type of game that's only hard if you suck. Actually, that's not really fair to say, because there are a couple of bosses and little traps that'll kill you at least once before you'll understand what you're supposed to do. So, it's easy when you know how. So, pretty much Rocket Knight Adventures is absolutely brilliant in nearly every way, and I simply cannot recommend it enough. And now for the time, where we talk about why this game never really caught on. So why did this game fail to catch on? Well, it didn't! It wasn't the smash hit blockbuster it had every right to be, but it did spawn two sequels, one for the Genesis and another for the Super Nintendo. Now some of you are saying, wait a minute, there was only one sequel, Sparkster, and you'd be half right. Both games are called Sparkster, but the Genesis version and the Super Nintendo version are actually completely different games produced by completely different teams in-house at Konami. As for how these games measure up to Rocket Knight Adventures, I can't really say right now for two reasons. One, I simply don't have time to review two more games right now in this video. And two, I don't own either of these games, so I haven't played them in years. I remember not liking the Genesis version back when I was little, but that was a long, long time ago. And I've never even played the Super Nintendo version, so I'll have to save the Sparkster games for another review down the line. Alright gang, that about wraps it up. Now it's time for my favorite part of the video. Ha! <laughs> Alright, well, until next time, this is the Happy Nerd saying, don't be negative. Cheers. Mega Man 9 is the most brilliant thing Capcom has done since reinventing the Resident Evil series with Part 4. It's really unbelievable that I'm even playing this game. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would not only be playing Mega Man 9, but playing it as if it were an original Nintendo game and loving every fucking second of it. I always assumed that if Mega Man 9 ever actually happened, it would be some quick crappy cash-in for the PS2 or Game Boy. And Mega Man had spawned so many different series over the years, who would have thought that Capcom would go back to the first one? While Mega Man is one of, if not the, most prolific video game character of all time, there have only been a handful of truly outstanding titles. For me, not since 1993's Mega Man X for the Super Nintendo has a Mega Man game met my expectations. Not to say that every game after that was bad, but most were typically average enough to be profitable. 
There hasn't been a truly noteworthy Mega Man game in forever. And it brings me so much joy to say that we have finally received a Mega Man game worthy of the titles that made him a legend nearly 20 years ago. Early impressions of Mega Man 9 promised classic old school style right down to the fucking box art. It was an absolutely brilliant idea, and as a diehard Mega Man fan since preschool, it was one of the greatest gaming experiences for me in a very long time. It's every bit as fun as I remember playing the classic Mega Man titles at elementary school, except this time I don't have to worry about spelling tests and geography homework. New Super Mario Bros., Contra 4, Bionic Commando Rearmed, and now Mega Man 9. It has never been better to be a retro gamer. Thank you, Capcom. Thank you. Even if this really is the last great Mega Man game, this makes up for over 15 years of disappointment. So, if you haven't figured it out yet, Mega Man 9 revisits the original style of Mega Man, last seen in 1993's Mega Man 6 for the original Nintendo. It's been over 15 years since they got a Mega Man game that looked like this, and if you ask me, it's also been 15 years since they got one really worth playing. It's like somebody at Capcom finally realized, after reinventing this series a dozen times, the original formula didn't need to be messed with. Mega Man had been changed and reinvented so many times over the years that going back to basics was actually a welcome change of pace. Imagine that. Mega Man had actually reached the point where being completely uncreative was actually the creative solution. Wrap your head around that one. The main reason Mega Man 9 works is that the creators were serious about not really being all that serious. So bad it's good fits this game to a T. Let's check out those bosses. Plug Man, Tornado Man, Concrete Man, and Galaxy Man. And let's take another look at that box art. Look how terrible it is. Awesome! I mean, Mega Man has always been a little cheesy, but this time they really turned up the cheese. If you look back at Plant Man and Blizzard Man and... Uh, Dust Man? We're laughing at the creators. Seriously, fucking Dust Man? Dust Man? Look, even he's shrugging! But this time we're laughing with the creators. Hornet Man, Jewel Man, Magma Man, we know it's bad. And that's why we love it. How about that box art one more time? Ah, <laughs> Genius! But we do have our very first female robot boss, Splash Woman, so score one for equality, huh? Now I can already hear some of you. Man, this game is too hard! Ugh, too hard? I don't even want to go there. But honestly, every single time I died, I felt it was typically because of my own carelessness. I mean, maybe I'm just too used to being really good at Mega Man games. I just get cocky and, you know, fools rush in. Except that last Wily boss, fuck that was hard. But this doesn't even come close to the brutal difficulty of Contra 4, which even I'll admit was almost too much. I'd say Mega Man 9 has a much more manageable difficulty than Contra 4, but it certainly feels like the good old days. And if you fancy yourself a retro gamer, but were unfortunately born too late to play these retro games when they weren't retro, now's your chance to discover a brand new game like we all did as kids. For most of you, this will be your first chance to play a brand new 8-bit NES game. I mean, the novelty of that alone should be enough to convince you to download Mega Man 9. Now, some might say this game is pretty short, and I'd say that's because there isn't any filler. Playing this game reminds me of all the annoying things I see in modern games. You see, old school games didn't waste your time with long-winded training stages where they held you by the hand and made sure you knew how to play the game before we started, no! In the old school days, you pushed start and then you learned by dying and dying again until you got good enough to move on to the next part where you will most likely die and die again. Or well, what they would do is they'd introduce to you a new gimmick on one screen and then thrust you into a large room where you had to utilize what you just learned two seconds ago. And Mega Man 9 retains this tried and true tradition. It keeps things fresh and doesn't break the flow of your adventure with a long, boring tutorial introducing some new element to the game. And once you beat it, there's always incentive to play it again, just to see if you can do it better. But this time, we get a modern twist to the replay in the form of gaming achievements, some of which are frankly ridiculous. Clear the entire game without missing a shot? Defeat all bosses with only one clip of energy? Um, I'll pass. I've got other games to play. Who's got time to clear the entire game without getting hit? If that type of stuff actually seems worth your time, then, you know, hey, more power to you. I guess I'm just not hardcore. So even though there's a handful of achievements that I will probably never actually complete, I still really like this marriage of the new and old school. Hey, I love old school games more than the modern ones, but even I'll admit there's been some great advancements over the years. 
I'm gonna have to stop myself here, because trust me, I could go on for hours about Mega Man and Mega Man 9. Bottom line, it's an awesome game and you should download it for your Wii, Xbox 360, or PS Triple. But as a fan of the series, I'd like to take this time to share some of my thoughts about the Mega Man games as a whole. If you're a retro gamer who, like me, grew up in the late 80s and early 90s, your first systems were probably a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, or a Genesis. Which meant that chances are you were either a Mario kid, a Sonic kid, a Zelda kid, or, in my case, a Mega Man kid. Some kids are all about the Sonic, Zelda, or Mario games, and while I certainly had nothing against them, I would always choose Mega Man over any of those in an instant. But that was a long time ago, and honestly, it hasn't been easy to be a Mega Man fan for the last 15 or so years. Oh, there have been some decent titles, but nothing has ever come close to the original games that consumed so many wonderful hours of my youth. And I think longtime Sonic the Hedgehog fans feel the same way. The Sonic games on the GBA and DS aren't bad and still retain that classic look and feel, but just like the Mega Man Zero and ZX games, it's just not the same. And don't even get me started on the Battle Network series, who the fuck keeps buying those? Mega Man 9 is just as much a parody of the glory days of Mega Man as it is an homage. Because of this, it could never be as good as parts 2 and 3. So let's all just agree that this is as good as it's ever gonna get. And if you honestly harp on this game for not being as good as parts 2 and 3, you need to shut up and just be thankful for what you've got. What we've got with Mega Man 9 is unprecedented. This is not a reinvention or an updated port, this is a return to form. My gratitude for Capcom far outweighs my rabid fanboyism. Not that there really is that much to nitpick and complain about, I feel that doing so would just be disrespectful and ungrateful of me. So my two cents on the matter is, it's not perfect, it never will be, but the fact that we've even got this in the first place makes nitpicking disrespectful. And hey, maybe if we're nice, look at Mega Man 10, right? Actually, I take that back, because I don't think Mega Man 10 will really be necessary. I know as a fanboy I'm supposed to be insatiable and constantly demand more, but I'm just not greedy. I don't want Capcom to ruin a good thing. Over the years, Capcom has always kind of annoyed me with their ridiculous love affair with milking franchises. For every legitimate game they release, four quick cash sequels or spin-offs are also released. If Capcom really wants to seal the deal with this return to form, they will only make Part 10 if they really put in the effort like they did with Part 9. For me, Mega Man 9 was a chance for redemption, and from a game-making standpoint, it was an absolute success. Now let's just see if Capcom can redeem themselves further by not milking this cow dry. I'd hate to see this time next year something like, COMING SOON, MEGA MAN 12! It's just not necessary. Now that you fixed Mega Man, go back and fix Dino Crisis, or bring back Gargoyle's Quest or Little Nemo. But take your time with Resident Evil 5. Delay it as many times as you want, I know it'll be worth the wait. Well, that's it for now. So until next time, this is the Happy Nerds... What the hell? have never realized it, but the word unique starts with a capital D. Warp D may be the most unique horror experience on a console. Not so much a game as it is an interactive movie, D is still one of the scariest experiences in gaming. Released in 1995, appropriately enough the same year as Pixar's feature debut Toy Story, D was the first 100% CGI game. It was like Myst, if instead of clicking to the next step, your character physically moved and instead of a deserted island, a haunted castle. By its very concept, D has little inherent replay value, and just may be too unconventional for some tastes. But, for those who can get into it and love a good scare, lock the door, turn out the lights, and crank up the sound. D is a gaming experience you may never forget. D was released on the PlayStation, the short-lived Sega Saturn, and the even shorter-lived 3DO. 
I'm playing it on the Saturn, but all versions are virtually identical. I mean, I'm sure 13 years ago, some would be able to argue about which version looked best, but it's a moot point now because they all look bad by today's standards. What you have to realize is what a bold move this game was. I mean, CGI in video games was a pretty new thing back in 95. D was released at the tail end of the full motion video craze of the mid 90s. No! Don't go! And games are just starting to have little CGI bits, but a whole game of it was unheard of at the time. But straying far from the mainstream was the typical MO of warp games, but we'll get to that later. Richter Harris is the respected and beloved director of a rural Los Angeles hospital. That is, until one day he suddenly snaps and goes on a murderous rampage, killing many of the hospital staff and its patients. Police summon Laura, his daughter, to go and talk to the doctor who has barricaded himself inside the hospital, holding the surviving patients as hostages. What could have possibly drove this man to such barbaric actions? Will Laura be able to penetrate the riddle of a transfigured father? I took that last part from the instruction book. As a game, D is as basic as it gets. You move Laura around by pushing the direction you want her to go. She'll move in that direction and then stop at an invisible intersection. From there, you can manipulate what's in front of you or move on. Using the shoulder buttons shifts through your inventory and that's about it. I told you it was unconventional. D is more of an interactive movie than it is a game. There's some pretty tough puzzles, but other than that, you just sit back and enjoy the thick, creepy atmosphere and wonder what kind of weird shit's around the corner. But just because there's little interaction doesn't mean this game is boring. Well, maybe for some. Now, a common horror movie convention is watching our heroes go into places they probably should not go, like outside to investigate a noise or into a stranger's house. When you yell at the screen, What are you doing? No, don't go in there! That's a scary movie doing its job. What makes horror games so scary is forcing the player to go into those very places they would rather not go. I recall saying out loud while I was playing Silent Hill for the first time, I'm not going in the hospital morgue, are you crazy? Or, oh great, a secret staircase in the basement. Can't wait to go in there. But D is scary because of its unrelenting creepy atmosphere. Unlike Resident Evil and Silent Hill, there are no safe rooms. There is no downtime between areas. You are constantly in a place you don't want to be. Not only that, you have no choice but to venture deeper and deeper into it. And Warp makes sure that you get the most out of your time there. If you can really get into this game, you will constantly be on edge. You really don't know what to expect next. It is established very early on that D takes place outside of the confines of reality. So anything can happen and it doesn't really need to make sense. Before long, you'll realize that every part of every room that you can explore has some creepy guy waiting to creep you out. It might be the subtlety of the music or just something about the room that you're in. The journey to the end of D may be short, but it offers virtually no downtime with the exception of maybe one puzzle. And since you don't really have complete control of Laura, you never really get a good chance to explore and become comfortable with your surroundings. This can heighten the mood, as sometimes you'll be standing at the threshold of a new room that you might not want to just run into. In Resident Evil and Silent Hill, you can ease your way into a suspicious room. Take your time and explore, make sure things are safe before pushing onward, but not in D. You're either in or you're out. Pick one. Now. And I mean now, because the clock is ticking. There are only a few ways you can die in this game, and one is if you take too long to complete your journey. You take long in the two hours to finish D, and it's game over. But that's the limit. I personally have never taken longer than an hour and a half to finish this game. But that means there are no save points, and I really like this, no pausing either. But you can't deny the fact that this is a very short game with very little replay value. But again, it's more like a movie than a game anyway. And just like a good scary movie you've seen before, it's worth playing D once every couple years. I've long since played through the Resident Evil and Silent Hill games, but every once in a while, I just gotta play through them again. And D is no different. It's a very short but very memorable experience. It's never as scary as it was the first time, but that doesn't make it not enjoyable. The concept, story, and execution of it all make it an experience worth revisiting at least twice. But please, don't go watch videos of D online. You're only cheating yourself. This is a game you have to experience at home with the lights off and the sound up. Hell, that's the only way to play games like Fatal Frame and Silent Hill. And you'd never guess, this game also has an interesting history, so let's hit it. D 
was made by Warp Games, a company headed by Kenji Endo. Warp made a whole range of strange and unusual titles, not just horror games. But most of these never made it outside of Japan. The history of Warp is definitely an interesting one, but is for another time. This is a review of D, so I'll stick to D and its respective sequels. Apparently, D was heavily censored in the US, which is quite amazing considering what they left in. This is probably the most graphic teen rated game of all time. While it was a big hit in Japan, it wasn't very successful in the US. There exists an extremely rare Japanese version of D called D's Diner for the 3DO. It's sort of a super ultra mega double dip director's cut. According to an interview, this version was sold and hand delivered to buyers by Kenji Anno himself. Interestingly, the English translation of the Japanese name D no Shokutaku was incorrectly translated as D's Diner by the now defunct Game Fan magazine. While D's Diner does have a good ring to it, Shokutaku actually means dinner table, which makes a lot more sense since the setting of this game is not a <clears throat> diner. D was eventually followed up by D2 with the Dreamcast, but before we get to that, there were actually a couple games that came between D and D2. Enter 1997's Enemy Zero for the Sega Saturn. Enemy Zero was sort of a spiritual sequel to D. It was a horror title, played in the first person, and starred Laura. Not the same Laura per se, Laura was a digital actress as it were. Enemy Zero is famous for its free roaming first person segments, where you had to tread through sprawling, dimly lit corridors trying to avoid monsters you couldn't see. And these weren't monsters that would hurt you, nope, we're talking instant death. Since you couldn't see them, you had to depend on a chime that got faster and faster the closer and closer they got until... Yep, you died. And at least it's some pretty tense shit, let me tell you. Next came D2, but not that D2. D2 was originally going to be the flagship title for the M2. What the hell is the M2? The M2 was going to be the successor to Panasonic's 3DO. And I say, was going to be, because the M2 was scrapped and never released. Had the M2 been released, we would have seen a D2 that starred Laura's son and was more free-roaming. But as the M2 was scrapped, so was this version of D2. The D2 we all know is this one. Now, despite its title, D2 has almost nothing to do with D and has absolutely nothing to do with the scrapped M2 version. D2 had Warp's trademark creepy-ass story and tall supply of weird-ass shit, and once again starred Laura, but was more like a typical survival horror game. In fact, Kenji Eno pretty much quit games after this because he felt he was becoming too conventional. And I will say that is definitely one of the game's faults. Enemy Zero and D2 are both pretty unique and awesome games. And I suppose one of these days I'll have to tell you more about them. Alright, Paisanos, that's it for now. So, until next time, this is the Happy Nerd saying, stop emailing me about the Splatterhouse remake. Cheers. Because I already know about it! Hey, it's Derek. Um, I'm editing right now. As you can see, I'm editing the D video. There's the script for it. And I realized I forgot to shoot something, so I'm going to do that now. Um, I forgot one little audio thing. So I, I'm guessing, I, I guess I might make this as like a Easter egg for the DVD. Okay, so I have to, um, where is it? To find it first. Okay. Here we go. It's just an audio thing, so. Yeah, just, here we go. <laughs> what are you doing? No! Don't go in there! Okay. <laughs> what are you doing? No! Don't go in there! <laughs> this is awesome. What are you doing? No! Don't go in there! What are you doing? No! Don't go in there! You yell at the screen. What are you doing? No, don't go in there! That's a scary movie doing its job. <laughs> Hold on. What are you doing? No! Don't go in there! <laughs> okay.
Ladies and gentlemen, my childhood. When I think of the word nostalgia, I conjure up the image of Capcom's DuckTales for the Nintendo. It was one of my favorite childhood games, and it was based off of one of my favorite childhood cartoons. That's right, DuckTales is not just a kick-ass game, it's a kick-ass licensed game, and of a children's television show. Now I know for some of you this may be a difficult concept to grasp, but I got the proof right here. Bright, well-designed worlds, solid, unique, one-of-a-kind action platforming, and the very definition of a memorable soundtrack. All this for a title essentially made for kids? You bet! It's a game so good, even my big brother the angry nerd likes it! DuckTales was a very important and popular television show for its time, but today in the gaming community, the game is probably more well known than the TV series it's based on. Even if it wasn't a licensed game, DuckTales would still be a classic, but because of this distinction, it is noteworthy not just as one of Capcom's best titles in the NES, but as one of the greatest licensed games ever made. Or rather, one of the few licensed games truly worth your time. And before we move on, I want to take a moment to thank my parents for buying me this game for my birthday. This is the very cartridge given to me on my 7th birthday, so thanks mom and dad! In DuckTales you play as Uncle Moneybags himself, Scrooge McDuck. And what else is the world's richest duck doing? Getting more money! The game consists of five levels played in the order of your choosing, each with a million dollar treasure guarded by a boss. And along the way you'll collect diamonds, rubies, and other treasures hidden in every nook and cranny of the five levels to add to Uncle Scrooge's money bin. It's a simple plot, but typical for your average episode of the show, so the storyline's appropriate. There are two forms of attack, but you use one way more than the other. You can use your cane as a pogo stick or as a golf club, but as I'm sure you've noticed, you use the pogo stick method as your basic form of attack. This isn't the hardest game out there, but getting that pogo move down can take a little practice. If you land a little off center or go into it a little too close to the enemy, you'll miss your target and take damage. And it can get stressful at times because you have so few hits and very short post damage and vulnerability. Oh, and there's no continues. This all combines to a pretty balanced experience. I mean, it is a short 5 level game, but it's pretty unforgiving with its precision heavy controls, limited supply of health, and lack of a continue feature. Oh, and did I mention multiple endings and difficulties? Not only is it balanced, it's got some pretty decent replay too. The level design is really where DuckTales stands out from similar games at the time. None of the levels are a straight line to the end. In addition to that, there are hidden rooms and treasures everywhere, and I mean everywhere. There are so many hidden diamonds and treasure chests you couldn't possibly find them all on your first time through. I mean, I've been playing this game for over a decade, and I'm sure there's still a few I've missed. And if you want to get that top score and the good ending, you'll have to find the super valuable hidden treasures. There's only five levels, but each one is packed with secrets, traps, treasures, and enemies. The music in this game is phenomenal, to say the least. The most famous track is, of course, from the moon level. I'm willing to bet that there are more gamers who recognize this song than know it's actually from the DuckTales game. Oh, man, so good. Man, screw greatest video game songs ever written. This is just one of the greatest songs ever written. But what would you expect from the same guy that co-composed the first two Mega Man games, Yoshihiro Sakaguchi, aka Yuki-chan's papa? And by the way, The Advantage did an amazing cover of the song on the sophomore record Elf titled. In fact, both their albums are amazing. It's back in stores now. But all the 8-bit music you've heard so far is from the other levels of the game. So, the moon level easily trumps all, but the rest of the soundtrack is certainly no slouch. So, it's a great game based on a license, but how faithful is it to that license? I'd say pretty faithful. The title screen accurately portrays that super catchy theme song. You play as Scrooge McDuck, and along your adventure you run into your nephews Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And there's Webigail, Mrs. Beagley, Gizmo Duck, Bubba, and the man himself, Launchpad McQuack. Launchpad even calls him Mr. McD. And there's some of the show's main villains too, like the Beagle Boys, Magic at Dispel, and Flint Heart Glomgold. But there are a few coloring mistakes, like Scrooge's coat is actually blue. Same with Dewey, who on the stage left screen is wearing green. And the Beagle Boys don't wear white, they wear red. The weird thing is, is most of these mistakes were fixed in the ending. DuckTales was made by Capcom, or more specifically, Tokuro Fujiwara. Or even more specifically, the fucking man. Fujiwara is responsible for Ghosts and Goblins, Mega Man's 1, 2, and 3, Gargoyles Quests 1 and 2, and the Tomba games for the PS1. So it's done one of the first DuckTales game was so solid. That's right, there was a sequel. 
DuckTales 2 that also came out for the Nintendo. Most people probably don't know about this game because it came out in 93, near the end of the Nintendo's life cycle and long after the show started its first run of syndication. DuckTales 2, also made by Capcom, has nearly identical gameplay from the first one. The graphics are much better, but the music, while still solid, is nowhere near as memorable. The controls and hit detection feel tighter, so hitting enemies is a little easier. The levels have more hidden paths and puzzles to them, but it feel padded, making them feel longer than they actually are. There's upgradable weapons, gadgets, and a store this time around, which is pretty cool. And there's a little more variation this time than there was in the first one. On its own, it stands as a pretty solid NES title, but just isn't as good as the first one. One thing that really irks me is that Launchpad and Gyro keep calling you Uncle Scrooge. They're not related to Scrooge. That's why Launchpad says Mr. McD in the TV series. And you lose all your money when you die, unless you keep buying safes. And you have to buy a new one every single time you finish a level. That just seemed really stupid. DuckTales 2 is pretty rare and will net you around 50 bucks. It's not as good as the first one, but it's still recommended. It's one of the better titles from the post-Super Nintendo days of the NES. <coughs> DuckTales 1 and 2 are also ported to the Game Boy, and though I got them right here, handheld games aren't my forte. Gotta call the man. Hello. Hey, what's up, dude? How's it going? Alright. Hey, how are DuckTales 1 and 2 on the Game Boy? Pretty good. I liked them. Alright, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, later. Peace out, be Alright, now we talked about all the games. I think it's time we switch gears now and talk about the cartoon DuckTales, because it had a larger impact on television history than I think any of us ever realized. DuckTales was a syndicated cartoon series developed for children's television by Walt Disney Television Studios. I know most of you already know this, but hold on, I'm going somewhere with this. DuckTales was the first in a line of half-hour cartoons developed that included Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, Darkwing Duck, Bonkers, and Goof Troop to name a few. Not bragging, but I can still sing at least a portion of most of these show's theme songs at will. New episodes of DuckTales ran from 1987 to 1990. To put that into perspective, that was when I was three and six. Syndicated, high-budget children's cartoons are as common as day now, but what many probably never realized is DuckTales was the first. It may be hard to imagine nowadays, but before DuckTales, once a children's cartoon ran its course, it was finished. Unless you were an inexpensive hit like Scooby-Doo or something. But for example, Muppet Babies, another fantastic childhood classic, didn't go into syndication until 92, two solid years after it ended. DuckTales, on the other hand, was produced for syndication right from the start. Some sources claim that DuckTales ran all the way from its 1987 inception until 2001, others until 2004. At the time, this syndicated high-budget approach was a huge gamble for Walt Disney Studios. But it paid off, as the show turned out to be a huge hit, even spurring competition for Disney with shows like Tiny Toon Adventures and Animaniacs. What does this all mean? This means that DuckTales changed television, and is the reason for the myriad of children's cartoons today. And it really is just a fantastic show. It's out on DVD now, and I highly recommend it. I know it's a kid's show, but there are so many stupid and corny jokes that it's honestly fucking hilarious at times. And hey, you can watch it with your younger siblings and relatives. But I wish the people who produce these DVDs realized that a lot of older people buy them out of nostalgia. The 1980s Transformers and WALL-E DVDs both have special features for both kids and movie lovers. This is the kind of approach I wish DVD producers would have with shows like DuckTales. Because honestly, before I started doing research for this video, I never knew DuckTales has such an amazing history behind it. But then again, this gives me the opportunity to tell you all about it. Yeah, never mind, they're lost. That's it for DuckTales, but stay tuned, because pretty soon we'll be talking about a very similar licensed game. So, I'll catch you next time. Cheers. Uh, peace out, bitch. I got nothing. Uh, um... <laughs> and what else is the world's richest duck doing? Get more money. 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 Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, my childhood part two. Some things just go together. Milk and cookies, nouns and vowels, Max Bemis and Chris Connolly, and of course, DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Discussion of one will invariably lead to another, especially when discussing the amazing NES games. So, since we've already talked about DuckTales, it only feels right we talk about Rescue Rangers. I mean, they both represent the best entertainment from my childhood and represent the best of the NES's third-party titles. So not only are they among the greatest titles on the NES, DuckTales and Rescue Rangers both stand with GoldenEye, Chronicles of Riddick, Bucky O'Hare, and a tiny handful of other licensed games that actually matter. And they were both made by Capcom. Never mind the fact they're both children's cartoons. Name another company that has successfully made not one, but two amazing licensed games. Back to back. And with nearly completely different gameplay styles. Because that's exactly what Capcom did with DuckTales and Rescue Rangers. Rescue Rangers is a little longer, more linear, and faster paced than DuckTales. Its greatest feature being its two-player co-op mode. I will confess I probably prefer DuckTales to Rescue Rangers, but what's the point of playing favorites? You really can't go wrong with either one. Its impressive graphical presentation, solid soundtrack, and polished gameplay would have made it a classic without the Rescue Rangers license. But once again, because of this distinction, it is noteworthy not just as one of the greatest games on the NES, but one of the greatest licensed games of all time. The nefarious Fat Cat is up to no good! Again! This time he's captured Gadget! That fucker! But don't worry, Chip and Dale are on the case. Rescuing Gadget won't be a walk in the park though, but thankfully you'll have Monty and Zipper to help you out. Together the Rescue Rangers will crush that fat cat once and for all, and make sure that he never- I'm sorry, do we actually play these old games for the story? Well I don't. Rescue Rangers does actually have a story, with a number of dialogue scenes throughout, which is admirable, but really unnecessary. They are peppered with helpful hints about the upcoming levels, but they're more annoying than anything else. But thankfully, they don't hamper the overall experience and are kind of a stupid thing to bitch about. If the main gimmick in DuckTales was the pogo stick and golf swing, then the main gimmick in Rescue Rangers is the boxes. The boxes littered throughout the game are Chip and Dale's main form of attack. Damn, those Rescue Rangers sure have a lot of energy. And man, Fat Cat's lackeys are such wimps. You don't even need to throw the boxes at them. Solid Snake wishes he could do this much damage with the box. DuckTales wasn't a very difficult game, and neither is Rescue Rangers, though Uncle Scrooge was better equipped than our Chipmunk heroes. Other than the boxes, there was no other way to defend yourself. And unlike DuckTales, there aren't any health upgrades, so be mindful of those three hit points. But both Chip and Dale can jump amazingly high, so maneuvering around the tricky segments later in the game are easy enough in the right hands. One disappointing thing, most of the bosses are stupid easy, and essentially all the same. I mean, the bosses in DuckTales are nothing to write home about, but the ones in Rescue Rangers are all a bit of a letdown. But all in all, it's a little harder than DuckTales, but it's nowhere near as difficult as other Capcom games like Codename Viper or Little Nemo. Of course, things are always made easier with a friend. The best part about this game is a two-player co-op mode. Nick! Now where am I gonna find somebody to play Rescue Rangers with me? Neckbone, neck neckbone, 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 neckbone! Hey, neckbone. Neckbone! Are you gonna behave yourself this time? Bone. Keep the lid on it, I still have to finish the review. Bone. Anyway, the greatest and most enduring part of Rescue Rangers is the co-op. And there really isn't much to say about the co-op mode, except it's fucking awesome. Well, I guess there are a couple things. You can't hurt your buddy, but if you hit them, they'll be stunned for a minute. And if your buddy sucks, you can just pick him up and carry him. <laughs> hey, Neckbone, I am literally carrying this team. Wow, you are a lot better at Star Tropics. Damn, dead already? Jeez, Neckbone, you suck. Boom! Are you serious, man? Really? Neckbone, boom! Who knew a sock puppet could be so sensitive? Neckbone. If the two-player co-op mode is the greatest feature of Rescue Rangers, then the most memorable thing is the look of the game. Chip and Dale are of course pint-sized gumshoes, so every level is designed from their perspective. It really feels like you're playing a cartoon, more so than DuckTales. I mean, every game has a snow level or a space level, but what other game has giant trees, laboratories, and kitchens? Yes, yes, I know, monster in my pocket, but that's for another day. What I'm trying to say is ninja flying squirrels are awesome. 
and so is running through giant factories on power lines and shutting off giant faucets. I guess I'm just a sucker for this kind of aesthetic. Just like with Little Nemo, you'll never have more fun feeling like a kid again. The experience of DuckTales can be described as quality over quantity. There were only five levels, one of which you visited three times, but to make up for this they were all unique, sprawling, and well constructed, and you could choose your own level, not unlike Mega Man. But with the Rescue Rangers, you get more of a quantity over quality feel. There are ten levels in total, three of which are skippable since you are free to move around the board, not unlike Mario 3. But since there's more of them, they are all completely linear and shorter than those found in DuckTales. Rescue Rangers and DuckTales both have incredible soundtracks, but again, it's quality versus quantity. DuckTales may have fewer songs than Rescue Rangers, but Rescue Rangers songs are much shorter and are more repetitious. Short as they may be, there's more of them, so in the end you're getting about the same amount of music as with DuckTales. In the end, both games complement each other's shortcomings, and are sort of yin and yang of awesomeness. But if you must play favorites, it really doesn't come down to which one of these two is better. It really comes down to which one of these better suits your preferences. Quantity or quality. One complaint I have with Rescue Rangers is the piercing, shrill noise of when you pick up items. Littered throughout the game are flower icons and stars, and every single time you pick one up you hear one of the most grating noises in an S game. I must confess that this game gives me a headache if I don't turn the volume down low, but maybe this won't bother you. And yet another similarity to DuckTales, Rescue Rangers also got a late NES sequel. I felt that DuckTales 2 had some shortcomings, but still came recommended. Though far from a terrible game, Rescue Rangers 2, however, is a much bigger disappointment. First, the good points. The sound of collecting items is no longer headache-inducing, which is a huge relief. The game is more graphically impressive. You can throw boxes diagonally now. The boss fights are a little more interesting this time around, and the controls feel a little tighter. But there are some huge problems here. Though the boss fights are a little different this time, they tend to take forever. You see, in Rescue Rangers 2, there isn't just a ball sitting there waiting for you to use, like in the first one. You have to wait for the boss to actually give you the object to throw back at them, kind of like in Kirby. This means you spend most of your time just waiting for it to show up. And this game honestly has the most boring and anticlimactic final boss fight I have ever played. And Jesus Christ, there was way too much story this time around. I've said this before, if I want to get lost in a good story, I'll watch a movie or read a book, not play Nintendo games. There is a ridiculous amount of dialogue here, and all it does is slow things down. It's not even peppered with helpful hints this time, it's completely pointless. Once again, the soundtrack doesn't hold a candle to the original, but at least DuckTales 2 had a few memorable tracks. And finally, all the levels are boring. A restaurant? A freezer? A haunted castle? Where are the enormous sinks, the giant tree limbs, the ceiling fans? You could just remove Chip and Dale from some of these levels and throw in Mega Man and I wouldn't notice the difference. But by this time in the NES's lifespan, Capcom had pretty much written the book on this type of game, so all in all, it's still a solid NES title, but when compared to the original, it's garbage. My guess is by late 1993, Capcom must have been hard at work on something else. Of the four games, it's easily the worst one. But when compared to most games in the NES's library, it still comes recommended. Unlike DuckTales, the Rescue Rangers games were never ported to the Game Boy. Unless you count Mickey's Dangerous Chase, which had similar gameplay and was also made by Capcom. But they both had PC games. However, I decided not to mention the DuckTales PC game in that video because, just like with the Rescue Rangers PC game, I have nothing to say about it. I don't own either of these games, I never played either of these games, and neither of them was made by Capcom. The few reviews I found spoke well of them, so I guess they're worth checking out if you're really interested. So to sum up, both DuckTales and Rescue Rangers represent the finest in licensed games on the NES, by arguably the system's best third-party developer. Their respective sequels didn't impress me as much, but they still come recommended, though I wouldn't pay too much for Rescue Rangers 2. But these aren't the only two games that Capcom made for Disney. Disney and Capcom had a very fulfilling partnership back in the NES and Super NES days, and there were a lot of awesome games that are the product of this partnership. And I got most of them right here. So tune in next time, we'll talk about the rest of the awesome Capcom and Disney games. So until then, this is the Happy Nerd saying, is it wrong for me to be drinking an alcoholic beverage while I just got done talking about games essentially made for kids? Yeah. It probably is. Ah!
Neck! Neck! The best part about this game is the two-player co-op mode. Neck! Now where am I gonna find somebody to play Rescue Rangers with me? Neck bone, neck bone, neck bone, neck bone, neck bone! Hey, neck bone. Neck! Boom! Are you gonna behave yourself this time? Boom! Keep the lid on it. I still have to finish the review. Boom! Anyway, the Damn, greatest I'm dead already? Jeez, that one, you suck. Boom! Are you serious, man? Really? Not boom! Boom! Who knew a sock puppet could be so sensitive? Not boom! If two players. <laughs> Alright. What do you think, Nightbone? <laughs> Go! Come on up and say hi, Monty. Get in the frame here. In the frame? This is Monty. He's playing Nightbone this time. Boom! I don't do the voice. Boom! <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> okay. One of these days. Why are you recording me? It's for the hell of it. Timing and shit. Okay, so. You think neck bone? You ready to spread the good word of gaming or what? Neck bone! Neck bone! So remember, okay. until next time, neck bone! But don't worry, there are no passwords in this game, only saves, which is another big plus. But there are a few things about this game that I feel did not age as well as fuck. <laughs> you had your mouth open, dude. <laughs> you your neck bone? Yeah. Was yeah I was just looking at you with my mouth open. It was hilarious. <laughs> Capcom is the greatest third-party video game developer of all time, in this reviewer's opinion. 1943, Ghosts and Goblins, Final Fight, Mega Man, Street Fighter, Resident Evil, Capcom's rap sheet is the stuff of legends. But of all their achievements, few acknowledge one of the company's most impressive, the one-two punch of DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers, two of the greatest licensed games of all time. Most developers can't yield one decent licensed game. Capcom made two classics. But if you've already seen my reviews of those games, you know this. Hell, you knew that before I made them. Disney and Capcom had one of the most significant and fruitful partnerships in all of gaming. And though DuckTales and Rescue Rangers represent the best of the best, it is staggering how many great games came as a result of this partnership. Now I bet some of you are probably asking, wait a minute, didn't Capcom make that shitstorm? Mickey Mouse Capade? Well trust me, I'm not here to defend that garbage. If you've only heard about it and never actually played it, then rest assured what you've heard is true. It is a terrible, terrible game. However, Mickey Mouse Capay was actually developed by Hudson Soft. Capcom only published it in America. Now it's rumored that Mouse Capay was a hit for Capcom and may have been what spurred their partnership with Disney in the first place. If that's actually true, then I think we all owe this game a small amount of appreciation. I'm not saying you should own it or play it unless you're a nerd like me. Just have a little respect for it. Either way, it predates all of the Disney Capcom games, with the exception of only a few all come highly recommended. Alright, that's enough of this shit. Ugh. I'm not gonna lie to you here. Capcom made a ton of games for Disney, and I don't have them all. I can only review what I own, but I do have a large chunk of them right here. So how about it? First up, let's get dangerous with good old DW, the king of Disney cartoon cool. Who's Darkwing Duck can be described as a uh, poor man's Mega Man. There's a stage select like a Mega Man, you run, jump, and shoot just like Mega Man. Even the levels and enemies resemble some found in Mega Man. But DW has got some moves the old Blue Bomber didn't. Not only can he duck, pun intended, he can also grab and hang off of platforms. DW's ability to grapple onto platforms is a major part of the game, giving it an almost Gunstar Heroes or Strider feel sometimes. Capcom took this mechanic and really ran with it, constructing some really fun and challenging levels and boss fights. The game is loaded with action and platforming. Some of these aspects are used a year later in DuckTales 2. 
Another neat thing DW's got is that snazzy cape, but it ain't just for decoration, it can block enemy fire. Holy crap, it deflects knives! Let the discussion begin. Who would win in a fight, DW or Rick Taylor from Splatterhouse? Probably Rick. <laughs> I probably say this a lot, but I really mean it here. Darkwing Duck has one of the most overlooked soundtracks on the NES. Seriously, there is some classic stuff here. Each of the seven main stages all have amazing tracks. Remixers and cover bands take notice, especially that ending theme. But you get that Rescue Rangers vibe here. Tons of great tunes, except they're all pretty short. So if I may make a suggestion to remixers and cover bands. Medley? The look of the game matches the look of the cartoon very well. Each stage boss is a different villain from the show, which is a nice touch. It's even got my boy Launchpad right there. It once again shows that Capcom knows how to keep a game faithful to its license without compromising for solid gameplay. But like I said earlier, Darkwing Duck is pretty much a poor man's Mega Man. The biggest problem with Darkwing Duck is it's pretty tough, but not that good Journey to Silius or Star Tribe is kind of tough. It's a toughness that comes from a lack of polish. Uh, in a review like this, it's pretty much impossible to describe the controls other than a little stiff, but take my word for it, they're a little stiff. Go a couple rounds with DW and then go a couple rounds with the Blue Bomber and you'll see what I mean. But I wonder if this isn't just my problem. Like, it feels so much like a Mega Man game, maybe my brain has just been conditioned to think that it'll play as tight as Mega Man, which it unfortunately does not. DW's got that snazzy cape, but cool as it may be, it really isn't necessary. You see, not only can you not shoot while you're moving, you can't shoot while you're blocking with your cape either. Now that wouldn't be such a huge issue, but you can use your cape in mid-air. So very often you'll find yourself wanting to jump and shoot at something, but can't because you accidentally pushed up when you left the ground. It requires you to be really precise with your controls, far more than you would if you were playing Mega Man. Oddly enough though, this problem was fixed in the Game Boy port. And since jumping works just fine and you can duck, I rarely use the cape and often forget that it's there. Except when I'm trying to shoot at something and I can't. So, cool as that cape may be, I'm with Edna Mode on this one. There's also a few balancing issues. A lot of common enemies take a few too many hits to take down, and most bosses require a lot of hits. DW, on the other hand, only has four. For the whole game. Add in a pretty short post-damage blinking time and sometimes questionable hit detection, and you've got a game that's pretty tough, and again, for all the wrong reasons. If this duck had had a few more months to cook, it would have been a bona fide classic, but as it stands, it just misses the mark from getting a full video review from me. But it still comes highly recommended and is an essential title for diehard action fans and Mega Man fans. Rule of thumb, any game or cartoon with Launchpad is worth your time. I agree. Job well done, Capcom. Alright, next up we got The Little Mermaid. Now I bet a lot of you never thought a game based on The Little Mermaid would be any good. And while it won't set your world on fire, it's actually pretty damn good. And for the record, this movie, much like Beauty and the Beast, are really fucking good. When the hell did that happen? <laughs> This one was clearly made for the kids, as it's a pretty easy and short 5 level affair, but it's still solid. An interesting note about this game is it was made years after the movie, a fact that some like to complain about. Really? I'm sure this game is better because it wasn't made to coincide with the movie's release, which is something I think that dooms most movie licensed games in the first place. Actually, this may be the reason why the opening cinema doesn't follow the movie or really make much sense. Otherwise, there really isn't much to say about The Little Mermaid on the NES. Other than if you see it at a thrift store or a flea market, don't pass it by. The most noteworthy thing about The Little Mermaid? It's not total garbage, like I'm sure most people would expect it to be. But they all can't be zingers. Tailspin is garbage. I'll give Capcom an A for effort, but that's about it. There are two main gimmicks in Tailspin, and neither really work. One is the ability to switch the direction you're flying, and the other is the ability to shoot diagonally. Both of these are actually very uncommon in shooters, and there's a reason. Since moving up or down tilted diagonally, it makes it very hard to, well, I don't know, shoot what's directly in front of you. Furthermore, switching your direction is a major part of the game, which you can't switch directions while you're tilted diagonally. So get ready to die all the time because you weren't able to switch directions when you needed to. 
to answer the eternal question, what were they thinking? They weren't. It makes an otherwise average game into a complete waste of time. You're better off playing 1943, Legendary Wings, Life Force, and Xanak. It's not much better, but I'd say the Genesis version is more worth your time. But that wasn't made by Capcom, so I won't discuss it here. Bottom line, stick to the cartoon. There is definitely one game I really want to talk about. Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. I really want to talk about this game because it gets a fucking bum rap. For those of you in the dark, Adventures in the Magic Kingdom isn't a game based off a Disney cartoon, but was rather a series of different mini-games based on the attractions at Disney amusement parks, like Space Mountain and Pirates of the Caribbean. And all I see are videos and reviews whining about how broken and terrible this game is. Man, I don't know what the hell everybody else has been playing, but I'm here to set the record straight. It's not the greatest thing out there, and yeah, I hated it when I was a kid too, but I still recommend it over Tailspin and Rescue Rangers too. The biggest complaint seems to be that the Pirates of the Caribbean stage is impossible because you're completely defenseless against unavoidable enemies in the second part of the level. Well, am I the only person who knows about the candle located right here? Look, here's how you get to it. And it never runs out like in the Haunted Mansion. After this, the level becomes too easy. And speaking of the Haunted Mansion, another common complaint is the part where you're attacked by the flying books is impossible. For the record, it's not, but admittedly is a little cheap. But again, am I the only person who noticed the power-ups you can buy at the pause screen? Those stars you're collecting ain't just for decoration, you know. So if you're having trouble with the floating chair part, just turn yourself invincible. If you can't make those jumps, then that's your problem. Another common complaint I see is that you'll run out of candles fending off the flying books, leaving you defenseless. I never had this problem, not even when I was a kid. If you just skip over the grasping hands instead of wasting candles killing them, you'll have plenty. But hey, I'm not saying this game is flawless. The hit detection is sometimes worse than Darkwing Duck, the Big Thunder Mountain stage is pretty much a gamble, and Space Mountain requires some real concentration and quick reflexes. But I feel some of you just can't get over your childhood memories. Yes, it was a game made for kids, and yes, it was way too hard for us back then. I can't dispute that because I hated it when I was little too. But. When I play this game nowadays, I can't help but admit that I honestly enjoy it. If you've played it and hated it, clear your head of those bad childhood memories and give it another go. It's probably not as bad as you remember it. And if you've never played it before, give it a shot. It's really not as bad as people make it out to be. And either way, it's super cheap. So if you don't like it, you only got a few bucks. Oh, and it's got a damn good soundtrack. Alright, enough of the Nintendo. It's time we talk Super Nintendo. First up, we got Aladdin. Now, I bet a lot of people didn't know there even was a Super Nintendo version of Aladdin, because I think the Sega Genesis version is probably more remembered. First off, Capcom doesn't skimp on the presentation. The levels all look beautiful, the animations are all smooth and detailed, and the music faithfully recreates memorable numbers from the movie, while still having that distinct Capcom sound. This version emphasizes platforming more than straight up action. It has our hero being more acrobatic, which I feel better suits his character, unlike the Genesis version where Aladdin uses the sword. And honestly, I think this game feels more fun because of its unique emphasis on platforming. It's also more fun because it isn't fuck ridiculous hard like the Genesis version. You actually have a chance of seeing this version to the very end without breaking a couple controllers in frustration. But to be fair, the Genesis version is one of the hardest games worth playing. I'll tell you one thing the Genesis version didn't have. A fucking monkey following you around? Oh my god, the monkey thinks he's people! Yeah, get him little buddy, get him! Oh god, love that monkey. But now speaking of the Genesis version, I want to stop my review of Aladdin here. Because I just don't feel right talking about this game without directly comparing it to this game. Aladdin is actually a bit of an important game for the Genesis vs Super Nintendo debate. For the most part, the Super Nintendo was the better choice, but there were more than a handful of games where the Genesis arguably won the battle. I feel, to truly do this review justice, I'd have to give equal time to the Genesis version, and I'm not going to do that here. So, I'll leave it at, it's really good, not to mention completely different and easier than the Genesis version. And it's got a lot more than monkey. Next we're going to the Goof Troop, where we always stick together. Oh fuck you, it's a catchy song. Not the best game of the bunch, but definitely the most unique. In fact, I go as far as to say that it's one of the system's definitive two-player experiences. Thank you. 
Goof Troop is a co-op action puzzler that's reminiscent of both Zelda and Halo. You heard me, but allow me to explain. Not only does it just look like Zelda, it's got some pretty tough puzzles and boss fights. There may only be five levels, but this is by no means a short or easy game. In fact, those last few levels are fucking enormous. You're not given a map, but there isn't much emphasis on backtracking, so you really don't need one. Now, it's like Halo because Goof Troop has a very similar co-op mechanic. You'll remember that in Halo, during co-op play, you can die as many times as you'd like, just as long as your buddy doesn't die too. If your buddy dies, then you have to fall back and allow them to respawn, so you can both get back into the action. And I've always thought the co-op mode was more fun because of this. And this is exactly how Goof Troop plays out. If your buddy dies, you just move to another screen so they can jump back in. And this infinite lives respawn trick is really helpful because outside of the collectible items and objects lying around, you have no form of attack. You will die often. But don't worry, your buddy's got your back. Always sticking together indeed. And that's not all. Teamwork is essential because Goofy and his son Max both have their strengths and weaknesses. Goofy can take out most enemies with just one hit, whereas with Max it typically takes two. But Max runs about twice as fast as his old man. There are some rooms where it's easier to let Max run through and collect items while Goofy works on crowd control. It all adds up to an amazing two-player experience that sits with Zombies Ate My Neighbors, Turtles in Time, Smash TV, and Wild Guns. The game's biggest flaw? It's nowhere near as fun by yourself. I mean, it's not bad when you're flying solo, but once you've had a taste of that fantastic two-player mode, it's hard to go back. So, highly recommended, but only if you got somebody to play with. Best of friends forever! And finally, we come to the Magical Quest games starring Mickey Mouse. But there's a lot to go over here, so let's start with the history lesson. The Magical Quest games starring Mickey Mouse aren't based off specific cartoons as much as they are original platformers with some of Disney's most famous characters, like Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, and Pete. The main gimmick of the Magical Quest games were the costumes Mickey and his pals could switch to on the fly. <laughs> Jeez, Capcom, would it take that Mega Man concept for all it's worth? There were three games in the series, but things can get pretty confusing. The first one came out on the Super Nintendo in 1992 and was simply called The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse. You might have seen it on the cover of Nintendo Power. It was later ported to the GBA about 10 years later. Hang on here, because things are going to get complicated. The second game was released in America as The Great Circus Mystery starring Mickey and Minnie for the Super Nintendo and Genesis in 94. This was the only game in the series to appear on the Genesis. It too was ported to the GBA about 10 years later. However, that version was more appropriately called The Magical Quest 2 starring Mickey and Minnie. This title actually makes a little more sense because only one level takes place in a circus. The third and final game in the series, Magical Quest 3 starring Mickey and Donald, was released in 95 on the Japanese Super Famicom. Its only domestic release was on the GBA, again about 10 years later. And the only ones that I own are the Super Nintendo ports of Magical Quest and Circus Mystery and the GBA port of Part 2. Now with such a rich history, I'm sure some of you are wondering why am I talking about these games here and not giving them their own full review? And I thought for a long time about whether or not I should give this series a full video and I realized that at the end of the day, I don't have much to say about these games. I mean, they're not bad, they're just really not that good. But before I get to all that, let's start with the positive. They all have lush, beautiful, and detailed graphics. I can't vouch for the Genesis, but it's some of the most impressive graphics on the Super Nintendo. Once again, Capcom delivers the goods in the soundtrack department with tracks that aren't exactly memorable, but solid nonetheless. The overall presentation is imaginative, giving it a very lighthearted and warm aesthetic. I'm sure that Uncle Walt will be proud. But as you can guess, I had a couple gripes. The levels are all big and sprawling, creating the illusion that there's lots to explore, but there really isn't. These are actually extremely linear games, with very little emphasis on exploration, and absolutely no emphasis on backtracking. I mean, there are hidden items to find, but it really doesn't matter. You see, the biggest problem with these games is they're... boring. For example, each boss fight is a chore, because everyone takes like a million hits to kill. I recalled saying, oh my god, would you just die already? More than a few times playing through these games. I mean, it was a problem I had with Darkwing Duck, but it's an issue here. The bosses take far too many hits to kill, and you take far too few. Take the very first boss you fight in Circus Mystery. He's crazy easy, but takes eight goddamn hits to kill. And then look at this, is this not the most pathetic boss fight ever? I don't even have to move! But then again, these games can be surprisingly hard, especially part one. Like take this spider boss from part one, you gotta jump on him just perfect. 
and this Bionic Commando grappling hook thing is surprisingly hard to use. How could Capcom, the creators of Bionic Commando, make this part so difficult? Take these flying squirrels, for example. They're so unpredictable, it's almost impossible not to get hit by them because Mickey moves so slow. And that brings us back to my original point. These games just move at a snail's pace. Without a dash button, you're just praying for a hill you can stroll down to pick up the pace a little. Once again, the colors and animations are all beautiful, but that doesn't stop these games from being boring. But then again, because Mickey moves so slowly, it can be tough to move out of harm's way, resulting in a lot of cheap hits and deaths. I don't know, maybe I've played too much Little Nemo, but anytime these games gave me any real challenge, it was because of some cheap random enemy or because the boss fights just took forever. But I'm aware that I'm raining on people's childhoods here, so let me be clear. These are good games. They're all still really solid. And I'm sure my opinion of them would be different if I had played them as a kid, but since I have no nostalgic connection to these games, I have to be critical and honest. They really don't impress me much. I will confess I've never played the third one, but all the reviews I've read make it clear that it's par for the course and probably something I wouldn't enjoy. And this brings us to the end. Like I said earlier, I don't own all the Disney Capcom games. I'm only reviewing what I own, but this really was most of them. Capcom would continue making games for Disney over the years, but they became few and far between. Not to mention kind of shitty. So, where are they now? Disney actually had a ton of great games based off their cartoons. Virgin made a number of quality titles like The Lion King, The Jungle Book, and of course the Genesis version of Aladdin. Sega made a bunch of games for the Genesis, with Castle of Illusion, World of Illusion, and Fantasia. The two Illusion games are phenomenal. Fantasia, on the other hand, is fucking garbage. And then there's Quackshot, all the different versions of Mickey Mania, Rare's Mickey Speedway, the list goes on. And then of course there's the immensely popular Kingdom Hearts games. I myself am not a huge fan, but the series' enormous fan base is undeniable. Capcom would continue milking Mega Man, Street Fighter, and Resident Evil for all it's worth, while making new franchises to milk, like Onimusha and Devil May Cry. That said, they still remain a driving force of creativity in gaming, releasing many commercially unsuccessful yet critically popular games like Beautiful Joe, Okami, Killer7, Maximo, and Zack and Wiki. And Capcom would continue its streak of great licensed games, with titles like Little Nemo the Dream Master, the arcade and Nintendo version of Willow, the Dungeons and Dragons arcade games, and the phenomenal series of the Marvel fighting games, X-Men Children of the Atom, Street Fighter vs. X-Men, and the two Marvel vs. Capcom games, the second being one of the craziest, most ridiculous, and popular fighting games of all time. But before I wrap things up, let us not forget that there are a ton of great licensed games out there. Goldeneye, Chronicles of Riddick, Ghost in the Shell for the PlayStation, Astro Boy for the GBA, King Kong, Beetle Adventure Racing, The Warriors, the Rainbow Six series, Bucky O'Hare, Monster House for the GBA, a handful of TMNT and Tiny Toon games, the two PS2 Rocky games, the Genesis version of Dick Tracy, who knows how many Star Wars games, and not to mention recent titles like the Lego games, Ghostbusters, or Batman Arkham Asylum. I could go on, but the point is, there are way too many great licensed games out there to be so fucking angry all the time. Cheers. Ah! I've said that Capcom is the greatest third-party developer of all time, and I still stand by that. However, as I say this, I happily agree that Konami is a close second. As a matter of fact, the two companies have both had a sort of competitive relationship that goes back decades. Capcom had Resident Evil, Konami had Silent Hill. Capcom had Mega Man, Konami had Castlevania. Capcom had 1943, Konami had Gradius. Capcom had Final Fight, Konami had The Simpsons and Ninja Turtles. And finally, Capcom had Little Nemo the Dream Master and Chippendale Rescue Rangers, and Konami had Monster in My Pocket. 
Now the debate over which is better is heated for those first four, but there's simply no argument with that last comparison. When it comes to pint-sized licensed games on the NES, Monster In My Pocket doesn't come close to matching the greatness of either Rescue Rangers or Little Nemo. It certainly had potential to be as great, and I'm not saying this game is terrible, it's just that there's very little to really praise it for. It's not that it's bad, it's just not very good. Especially when compared to similar titles like Rescue Rangers and Little Nemo. Alright, first off, the game is really short and really easy. On my first try, I beat this game in 20 minutes, only using one continue. That's because if you die, you start right back where you died. Typically in a game like this, you'd start back at a checkpoint or at the beginning of the level. If you lose all your lives, then you have to start the level over, but that probably won't happen because most of the enemies are really easy to kill. And there's a ton of health just littered throughout the game's six short levels. I can't imagine how much easier this would be with two people. Also, you don't get any power-ups or special weapons, just your short-range energy wave thing. In some of the levels, you can find a giant key or a screw you can hurl at enemies, which I'll admit is pretty fucking cool. But you don't get a chance to use it that often, as it only appears in the first, second, and fifth level. And if you accidentally throw it off the screen, there it goes. So get used to this attack, because that's pretty much all you're getting. But it's not like you really even need special weapons, since again, most of the enemies are really easy to kill, you get a ton of health, and there's no real penalty for dying. Now I'm comparing this game to Little Nemo and Rescue Rangers because they all have that really cool, big little world perspective. And the first two levels in Monster in My Pocket look great. But then we're in a sewer, and then a construction yard, and then an oriental restaurant, and then like a cave or something, I don't know. We've seen how good this perspective can look when done right, and it simply isn't done right here. Most of the levels are boring, when they should look really cool and imaginative. It seems like a waste of potential. Monster in My Pocket has a laughably stupid storyline, and that's a plus in my book. So you know the monster and the vampire that is chilling, you know, watching some TV. When all of a sudden the bad guy comes on and says, I've sent my henchmen after you. And they pretty much go, uh-uh, we're gonna kick your butt. And that's it. Gotta love those terrible NES stories. I'll also give Konami praise for calling the Frankenstein monster, the monster, which is the correct name for that character. A lot of people seem to forget that Frankenstein was the doctor who made the monster, not the actual monster. But I will not give them praise for how silly the vampire looks. I know they're probably going for that classic vampire look, but come on, Konami knows how to make a cool looking vampire. But maybe this is the fault of the source material and not Konami, who knows. They're both still goofy looking when they run though. Another thing I'll give Monster in My Pocket the thumbs up for is a solid soundtrack. The soundtrack isn't quite up to the level of overlooked classics like Journey to Silius or Power Blade, but it's got some pretty damn good tunes. Just like with most Konami games, and much like its competitor Capcom, if the game is weak, chances are at least the soundtrack is good, which is most certainly the case here. But yeah, Monster in My Pocket is pretty lame, but worth the five bucks I spent on it. I'm sorry if I've disappointed the fans that have requested this game, but it doesn't really have that much going for it other than a cool concept and it technically being a decent licensed game. But it's short, it's easy, and really unimaginative. But if you want to talk noteworthy licensed games Konami made for the NES, you want to talk Bucky O'Hare. I'll see you on the next Game Quickie. Hey everyone, Happy Nerd here, and welcome to another episode of Sold Separately. Now, if you're anything like me, you still enjoy playing Game Boy games, but feel weird sitting at home playing a portable game system. That's why the Game Boy player for the GameCube kicks so much ass. You can play all nine DS Game Boy games at home on your TV. But I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to tell you about the only way to play games in the Game Boy Player. Bam! The Hody Digital Controller. Now some of you are saying, wait a minute, I never saw this for sale at GameStop or Best Buy or Walmart. That's because this bad boy had an extremely limited run here in America and was pretty much only released in Japan. Man, they get all the cool stuff. Look at this thing. Do I even need to explain it? It's a Super Nintendo controller with the GameCube's button layout. It couldn't be a more fitting controller. I mean, most GBA games have the same look and sound of a Super Nintendo game, or are Super Nintendo ports. In short, it's as awesome as you think it is. But let's take a closer look, shall we? The biggest and most noteworthy improvement over the GameCube controller is the D-pad. It's much bigger than that piddly little thing. 
And I'd say it's an improvement over the Super Nintendo controller too, because of the shape of the backside. As opposed to a flat backside, the Hori controller is better shaped to fit your hands. It's even more comfortable than the Wii Classic controller. This controller comes recommended as a companion to the Game Boy player only, as the D-pad is not a proper substitute for the GameCube's analog stick. Most cute games require use of the analog stick and are therefore not compatible with the Hori digital controller. So your best stick in the Game Boy games. That being said, I actually prefer this controller with GameCube games that are compatible with it, like Soul Calibur 2, Ikaruga, Resident Evil, Alien Hominid, and of course, the Zelda Collector's Edition. Man, it's so surreal to be playing a PlayStation 1 game ported on the GameCube with the Super Nintendo controller. Any game you can play with just the GameCube D-pad can be played with this controller, provided the use of the C-stick isn't necessary. For example, you can use the Hody controller to play Resident Evil Zero, but one of the game's main gimmicks, the ability to move your partner, is lost due to the absence of the C-stick. Which is really a shame because the game controls so much better on a pad rather than the analog stick. As you can see, the Z button has been mounted to the face, so it's only missing the two analog sticks. So if the game is analog stick free, you're good to go. One really lame thing, this controller isn't compatible with the Wii version of Mega Man 9, which is such a shame. But that brings up a good question. Is this controller compatible with Wii Virtual Console games? Well, I did my research and yes, this controller is compatible with some games on Virtual Console. I had to do research because I don't know firsthand. I don't download games on Virtual Console, why would I? I got the originals, punk! Anyway, this thing is definitely worth the money, if you can find it. It can be hard to track down because it has a really simple name. Digital controller. Or I guess, Nintendo GameCube Game Boy Play uh, Digital Controller. Over here was just called the Game Boy Player Controller, but again, good luck trying to find one. Just know that the company that made it is Hori. H-O-R-I. I wanted to give you a price, but when I made this video, I couldn't find any of these on eBay. So I have no idea how much these cost nowadays. My guess is it won't be cheap. So I'll wrap things up by saying happy hunting for this highly recommended controller. Until next time. Alright Paisanos, that's it for this one. So, until next time. What was I going to say? Uncreative was actually the creative set uh, oh, Who cares? I sure as fuck don't. <laughs> so if you haven't figured it out yet, Mega Man 6, 9, fuck. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is way harder than it looks. Yeah, boom! <laughs> Do we have audio on this? Yeah. In terms of action, and hey, if you fancy yourself a retro gamer, but were unfortunately born too late to play these retro games when they weren't retro... Yeah, you know, you can finish that thought yourself. D was released at the tail end of the video- oh, mm, 15 years ago. <laughs> Shit. Well, why do you have to- Why do I have to fuck it? Alright, Splatterhouse was an awesome video game series. That is not reduced. But this is all left- Fuck. Fuck. It's okay to be happy! That was terrible. What the fuck was that? Oh god, it tastes awful. Ah, oh, fucking it. For the record, I hate wine. And this is bad wine. Knock it off, okay? Stop ripping off James, you second. Wait. <laughs> oh boy. How it let... <laughs> Shit. Ah, oh, this is awful. <laughs> oh god. You know, it's like something I've always wanted to do is be like an action star. Like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> That's me fucking gangster right there. Okay. This is I the fuck here. Ah. Like ah. Ah. My mom is cleaning my bathroom. Never invite your parents over to your apartment. The concept, story, and execution. Oh shit. I am getting fucking tired. Oh my god. It is after 3 o'clock. 
It is a short five level game, but it's pretty unforgiving with its limited controls, precision heavy, hit points. Trust me, I could go on for hours about the Mega Man games and Mega Man 9. Just know that it's a fantastic game, and it's even better when I get what I wrote down right. It's embarrassing to me when I can't even remember what I wrote. This is why I'm not an actor. You're cheating yourself. This is a game you have to experience at home with the sound and up, TV on, sleeping in bed. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> not weird, is it? <laughs> Stop, dude, get off, man. Right, right. I spent all the time we got night. Uh, <laughs> I said Nightbone! I almost said Nightbone! <laughs> nightbone! Nightbone! Or it's worth playing D every once, every, ah! Oh. <clears throat> Bottom line, it's an awesome game and you should download it for your Wii and other systems. Okay. Ugh. The concept, story, and execution of it all, make it, an, make it an experience, make it an experience, okay. This, Metal Storm, is a classic Nintendo game that was completely overlooked, left behind, and forgot. But who cares? I sure as fuck don't. If I wanted a good story, I'd read a book, or watch a movie, or play Journey to Silius. I'm here to fucking stop laughing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mega Man 9 is an awesome game, and you should download it for your Wii, Xbox 360, or PS Triple. But as a fan of the games as a whole, I'd like to take this time to kind of share some of my thoughts about the games as a whole. Damn it. Alright. No, come on, you gonna do this? You gonna do this? <laughs> but the same cannot be said for its sequel, Star Tropics 2 Zoto's Revenge. <laughs> Way late. <laughs> Left behind and forgotten. I'll get it eventually. Zombies Ate My Neighbors is the type of game that could succeed on its premise alone, however it is a game that is just as fun as it is a brilliant idea. It's every B-movie and classic horror movie ever made rolled into an awesome action game. And when you think about it, there really aren't that many games like Zombies Ate My Neighbors. We've got our Resident Evils and our Silent Hills which deliver the scares, but how many games pay homage to and make fun of everything great and ridiculous about horror movies? Zombies Ate My Neighbors is that game. Oh yeah, and it's just as fun as you'd hope. 48 challenging and varied levels, including 7 secret levels. Fantastic music, tons of enemies, just as many weapons to use against them, 2 player co-op, you can't ask for much more in a 16-bit action game. Not without its flaws, but come on, Mars needs cheerleaders? All is forgiven. I can imagine this game is already a Halloween tradition for some of you retro gamers, and if it's not for you, then perhaps this Halloween is time you filled up your water Uzis and saved the neighborhood. The premise is simple. Everything from zombies to Martians, chainsaw maniacs to killer toy dolls, giant ants to giant babies, werewolves to vampires are out to terrorize your neighborhood. And you've got water Uzis, soda pop, fire extinguishers, silverware, Footballs, bubble guns, bazookas, and more to annihilate these fiends. Each level has no more than 10 people to save, and you gotta get to them before they do. Fail to save at least one of your neighbors or run out of lives, and it's game over. There are no continues, only passwords, but we'll talk about those later. Zombies Ate My Neighbors was made by LucasArts for both the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. Now, I'm playing the Super NES version because this is the version I've always had. I have played the Genesis version, uh, once. Um, at a friend's house, in elementary school, and all I remember was that version didn't look or sound as good as this version, but played every bit as well. However, if you play in the Genesis version, just like with the Lost Vikings, you gotta have a six-button controller. Man, their 
there sure is a hell of a lot of game here. Counting all the secret ones, there are 55 undeadly levels in total, each with dozens of enemies, weapons, and items. But for a game with so much variety, the pacing is brilliant. There are tons of different enemies out there to get you and your neighbors, but they're introduced to you slowly. The first 10 or so levels are essentially training, establishing new enemies, weapons, and tricks level designers use to hide secrets one piece at a time. This gives you plenty of time to experiment with the many, many items and weapons to be found. Everything can be killed with enough hits from your water, it was even, what are you, stupid? Experiment a little. Every baddie has a weakness, and you're given ample time to find these weaknesses. And you're gonna need to experiment with what you find, because it's not long before the designers start throwing everything at you. It's sink or swim, buddy. But you're seldom ill-equipped. There's stuff hidden everywhere. In cupboards, behind curtains, behind piles of sand, in bushes, underneath enemies. Collecting and managing your stuff is essential for survival and requires some careful consideration. Should you plow right into a room and potentially waste precious ammunition and health to save a victim, or do you hold out and risk their death and look for a better way in? It's something to think about because often the game deliberately gives you doors you don't need to waste keys opening. Yep, there's the exit. You saved all the victims, but there's still parts of the level to explore. Should you leave now or stick around and keep looking for more items? You expire, but the monsters never stop coming. Is it worth the risk to search out for more items? You can never have too much stuff, right? It's up to you. And again, with so much variety, you have the freedom to go through each level in a different way. Want to save keys? Don't want to find a way around? Blast your way through! Or you can do what I like to do sometimes, is use a monster potion and just smash your way through. Don't want to go through the trouble to save a hard-to-reach victim? Fuck, let them die! You don't have to save them all. But for each one you let die, there's one less to save in the next level. So be careful, or soon you'll be scrambling to find just one lone victim. There's a lot of running and gunning to do, but if you don't stop and think things through, you won't last long. But then again, though it is a tough game, it's not without its minor flaws. And these minor flaws push the game into that sort of gray area where it just might be too tough for some people. With so many weapons and items to sift through, it can be really hard to find what you need when you're in a pinch. There's no menu or inventory screen. You gotta cycle through your stock in real time. And you can't cycle backwards, so don't be too quick on that inventory scroll. If only you could pause the game and cycle through your inventory like you could in UN Squadron. But alas, you can't since that would ruin the co-op mode. So Zombies Ate My Neighbors is a little tougher than it should be. Now a true retro gamer is never scared of a little old school challenge. And this problem isn't as bad when you got a buddy playing with you, but it would still be challenging if there wasn't this problem with inventory management. And then pile on a pretty strict hit detection that makes it harder to hit enemies and pick up items than it should, and you got a game that you will not finish on your first or even fifth try. This ain't a walk in the park, but it's never overwhelming. Or at least not till way late in the game where it should be a little overwhelming. And speaking of the difficulty, I have a confession to make. I've never actually beaten this game, but that's only because the passwords don't save your items. If I haven't already made this clear, in the later levels a stock pile of weapons and items is absolutely necessary, and using a password starts you off with the bare essentials, pretty much leaving you stranded. If you want to beat this game, you pretty much gotta start from the beginning, or get really good and start from the middle. I'm pretty sure it's impossible, or it just takes far more patience than I have, to beat this game using the last password. Since you only get passwords every four levels, the last password starts you a few levels away from the final level. And to make it through those levels, you're gonna need a lot of firepower. The passwords are short, so they ain't that bad, but this inability to keep all the stuff you collected makes them nearly useless. But then again, if the passwords did keep all your items and weapons, they'd be fucking enormous, like the ones in River City Ransom and The Guardian Legend. So, the two big complaints I have with this game, the item management and the passwords, are really the result of the game designers kind of painting themselves into a corner. So I have a hard time really faulting the game for this. Still wish that hit detection wasn't so strict. If you are among the few that have beaten Zombies Ate My Neighbors without save states or Game Genie, then my hat is off. You are truly among the hardcore retro elite. Not flawless, but still incredible, however, we haven't talked about one of the most important things about Zombies Ate My Neighbors. 
all of this would just be fine mashed potatoes without the delicious gravy that is the masterful soundtrack. Amazingly, just like everything else, the soundtrack is also a great send-off to classic horror movies. It runs the gamut from pulse pounding to campy to gothic. It all lends itself to some genuinely creepy moments. In the later parts of the game, when you're down to just one or two victims, it gets pretty tense. And when you hear that harrowing <coughs> noise and you know you just lost a victim, shit can get pretty tense, man. So as goofy and as fun as this game is, a lot of credit goes to the sound effects and the soundtrack for making this a genuinely creepy game sometimes. So with a game this good, I bet you're wondering about the sequel, right? And there was a sequel to Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Sort of. Ghoul Patrol was released exclusively for the Super Nintendo about a year later. But according to designer Mike Ebert, it was never intended to be a sequel and was only labeled as such so that it would boost sales. Quote, it never really was supposed to have anything to do with Zombies Ate My Neighbors. The only thing that ever came close to an official sequel would be Herc's Adventure for the Saturn and PlayStation. It does to Greek mythology what Zombies Ate My Neighbors did for horror movies. I had never played this one either, but it looks way more promising than Ghoul Patrol. Though I had to say, zombies and Martians are way cooler than Greek mythology. At the top of this review, I said that there aren't many games that pay homage to and make fun of the horror genre like this one. You could argue that House of the Dead and the original Resident Evil were intentionally made cheesy as a send-off to terrible horror movies, but that's debatable. Stop it! Don't open that door! Zombies Ate My Neighbors is so clearly making fun of the genre. And it is true that House of the Dead Overkill, and to a lesser extent, Wet, are a direct send-off to Grindhouse Cinema, and it's true that Castlevania has been borrowing from the horror genre for years, but Zombies Ate My Neighbors scope of parody is so much more broad, therefore I'd argue it deserves more acclaim. And one last thing before I wrap things up, it's rumored that this game is on its way to the virtual console, so hopefully by the time most of you see this- Wait, back that up! While I was editing this video, Zombies Ate My Neighbors was released to virtual console, so get on that shit! All right, so that's three years, three Halloween videos. How about we end with some hilarious Halloween jokes? Why did the vampire go to the orthodontist? To improve his bite! What do you get when you cross a vampire with a snowman? Frostbite! What is a vampire's favorite holiday? Thanksgiving. Oh, this is gold material. What kind of streets do zombies like best? Dead ends. What is the skeleton's favorite musical instrument? The trombone. What do ghosts add to their morning cereal? Booberries. Oh, hold on, I got plenty more. You know, I've been making videos for a while now, and my goal from the start was to more or less bring us gaming nerds together by sharing with you some of my favorite games that I felt were overlooked or underappreciated. I don't want to cause a ruckus, I just want everyone to have a good time. But I know you can't please everyone, so I don't try to. And I'll admit that I've said my share of controversial things over the years, but that's just me speaking my mind. I'm never trying to be a dick when I say things people disagree with, that's just the way I think, man. However, I will admit that I have been pretty unfair and kind of a dick with one game pretty much from the start. Star Tropics 2, so does Revenge. In October of 07, I reviewed Star Tropics for the NES, one of my favorite games of all time. And in that review, I briefly talked about how much I hated the sequel, so does Revenge. And then proceeded to bash it anytime I could work it into an episode. And this really upset a lot of people. I don't think anything else has generated more backlash among my fans. Now, in my defense, these are my videos. I'll do whatever I damn well please in them. And that was my third video. I do sincerely apologize for not better studying my argument. At the time, I really didn't know better. I'm just a nerd with an opinion, and it's easy to forget the weight that one's words can have. And many people have rightfully pointed out that I didn't really present a proper argument against and so does Revenge at the time. It's something I regret, and have since then tried to avoid doing in future episodes. But don't be confused here. I only apologize for not better stating my case at the time. I still think this game is garbage, but for all the people who have written and commented, allow me to explain myself. Zoto's Revenge is a sequel and is therefore required to do something familiar yet different from its predecessor. 
And what we got this time was a time travel story, as opposed to the quest to find your lost uncle. Now I'm never one to hold a Nintendo game's story against itself, but not only was this premise kind of lame, they got rid of the yo-yo! Couldn't they have thought of an equally stupid storyline but kept in the yo-yo? That was my favorite part about Star Trek when I was a kid. I even stupidly bought a yo-yo thinking that you could fling it like Mike does, which I found out that you can't. Instead you hurl a never-ending supply of weapons like hammers, daggers, and swords. But unlike the different types of yo-yos you get in part 1, these don't downgrade as your health is depleted. Your magic item does, which shoots further than your weapons, but is weaker. And I'll admit, this is one of the few improvements made over the first one. It makes combat a little more balanced, but I still miss that yo-yo. But back to the story premise. Why Zoda's revenge? He wasn't really a huge part of Star Tropics. We didn't even know he existed until pretty much the very end of the game. I mean, never mind you killed him in part one. Why time travel? Why couldn't Zoda get his revenge by just kidnapping all the Ergonian children again? Then you have a simple setup. Seven kids on seven different islands, and you gotta rescue them all, right? Yeah, it's about as lame as time traveling, but at least Mike gets to keep his yo-yo. I have other gripes about this premise, but I'm not even gonna get into how fucking dumb it was to have Cleopatra ask Mike to bring her a pizza, hold the anchovies, or how dumb it was to find a chicken nugget buried in a cave. Bottom line, the time travel thing is a really stupid idea, but I honestly can't think of anything much better. But the story is just a minor gripe when compared to the changes made to the gameplay. A lot of people had a problem with the original Star Tropics because of its stiff controls. You see, in games like Blaster Master or Guardian Legend, you have a more familiar setup. If you push in one direction, you not only turn in that direction, but you also start moving. It's something you take for granted until you play a game like Star Tropics. Pushing in one direction simply faces you in that direction, so moving out of harm's way isn't as easy as you think. And there's no walking or jumping diagonally, it's like you're restricted to a chessboard. This is a deal breaker for many, because some people just could not get used to this design, and that's totally valid. I still argue that it worked for Star Tropics, because every dungeon was meticulously built around this design, so you were constantly rewarded for mastering all the traps and puzzles. But anybody who played Star Tropics to the end would probably agree that once you get used to this design, the game's brilliance is undeniable. But in Zoda's Revenge, I get the sense that the designers are trying to please both fans and critics of the first one. Mike can not only walk diagonally, but walk anywhere he wants, not to mention change his trajectory in mid-air. So that chessboard concept is gone. Now this may sound like the perfect solution to Part 1's biggest problem, but the levels in Zoda's Revenge still feel like they were designed for that old-fashioned chessboard setup. So what we have are levels that feel like they were made to complement the rigid design of the first one, but don't at all feel right with the loose controls and gameplay changes made for Part 2. In my eyes, this breaks the game, because there's still a lot of emphasis on platform jumping, and it's all made needlessly harder with this looser control mechanic. It can be difficult to gauge your distance and easy to miss your jumps. Some edges you can just walk off and die, making it even worse. And take this stretch of platforms here, they just don't work with this new design, but they would've been perfect with part one. Enemies can sometimes be just below your line of fire, but are still able to hit you. This kind of crap never happened with Star Tropics, because Star Tropics had a system that didn't need to be updated or altered. So what we have here is a game that looks like Star Tropics, kind of feels like Star Tropics, but it's not. It's something else trying really hard to be Star Tropics, while at the same time trying to be something completely different. It's a game with an identity crisis. Another deal breaker for me is an almost complete lack of post damage and vulnerability, or as I've always called it, blinking time. In most games, once you've been hit, your character blinks, and you're invulnerable for a few seconds, but not in Zoda's Revenge. You have a fraction of a second to get out of harm's way before you get hit again. But that's not so bad, you know, there are many games that have really short blinking times. Oh, but did I mention you're stunned every time you're hit, and when you're stunned you can't move or attack? I can't even begin to tell you how many times I died because I got stuck on top of an enemy and couldn't get away in time as they hit me over and over and over again. And it can be hard to move away from an enemy, because despite the fact that you can now move diagonally, you still have to face that direction before you can start moving. It's actually very difficult to move away from an enemy and walk away with any health at all. Look, see, I'm dead now. Boom, well, almost dead there. Look at that, oh, dead. So if you're not accidentally falling down pits, you're having your life drained so fast you can't do anything about it. It's not frustrating because it's hard, it's frustrating because every death feels unfair. And this all ties into my complaint about the premise. The game is called Zoda's Revenge. But Zoda wasn't even introduced until pretty much the very end of Star Tropics. 
So anybody who knows who Zoda is probably got very far or most likely beat Star Tropics. And if you played Star Tropics that much, you probably got used to the control scheme and gameplay mechanics. You probably therefore became a fan and picked up the second game and were like me and went, wait a minute, they changed everything. Why the hell did they do that? Seriously, who the hell did the developers think this game was for? And man, I ain't finished here. The graphics sure are hit and miss. And look at this, it's all just white up there. Couldn't they have put more trees or mountains? Yes, I know it's supposed to be snow, but they went through the trouble of putting buttholes on the hogs. Were fucking trees too much to ask for? My biggest complaint is the blandness of all the outside areas. None of the colors stand out, the look is very dull. The dungeons don't look too bad, but then again they don't look much better than the ones found in Star Tropics, and remember, that game came out three years earlier. The overworlds are all bland and boring, and the dungeons are only par for the course. And the music mirrors the graphics, in terms of quality. Music for the overworld is terrible. Take the cave music from the second chapter. God, what a barren composition. You think they could have added a bass line to give it some body? And then the streets of London? Some of this stuff seriously reminds me of the Master System. And for a first party NES game made in 94, that's just unacceptable. But that being said, the tracks for the dungeon fare much better. There's some quality stuff here, and this is definitely something I failed to mention in my review of Star Tropics. But again, it ain't got nothing on the first one. The best comparison is when you visit the first dungeon again. And I'm not being critical of the slight changes to the composition, that's fine, it's the overall tone. It just doesn't compare. But you're probably noticing a trend here. Zoda's Revenge sucks when compared to Star Tropics, one of my all-time favorite NES games. I mean, maybe if this game wasn't Star Tropics 2 and just some unrelated title like Time Traveling Mike, I could forgive these flaws. I have played this game through to the end, and I can say with experience, I cannot stand this game. But all this being said, I still recommend you play this game for yourself. And since my Star Tropics review, I have received about as many comments and emails that disagree with my opinion as I have that agree with it. I don't like this game. But judging by the emails, a lot of people do. So play them both and decide for yourself. They are both now on Virtual Console, and judging not by my opinion, but rather the general consensus, they are both games worth your time. I hate this game, but I've got no problem if you like it, you know? But I think we can all agree on one thing. This game brings out the worst in me, so I think it's time we wrap things up. I'll leave you with, remember, opinions are like assholes. Everyone's got one, including the hogs. Cheers. Oh, I'm sorry. He caught me in the middle of grading papers, but, you know, I could use a break. Let's get this crap out of here. Alright, I'll worry about you later. Ah. Welcome to another episode of The Gaming Historian, with me, your host, The Gaming Historian. You know, of the many failed systems out there, the Dreamcast is probably the most celebrated today. It, to this day, has a dedicated fan base with members so hardcore one of them most certainly just yelled at the screen because I dared call the Dreamcast a failure. Sorry. You know, it may have only been around for a few years and left as quickly as it came, but it was long enough to leave a lasting impression. Released on 9999, it had one of the strongest and most successful launches in history. Sonic Adventures 1 and 2 are often considered to be the only good 3D Sonic games. Soul Calibur was the first game to show that home consoles had surpassed the arcade. 
and is still considered one of the greatest fighting games of all time. Speaking of fighting games, the Dreamcast is the main reason why most of us play Street Fighter 3 Third Strike or Marvel vs. Capcom 2 in the first place. The Dreamcast was also the first system to successfully implement online play with games like Fantasy Star Online, Choo Choo Rocket, and Daytona USA. But without question, the cult classic of the Sega Dreamcast is Yu Suzuki's ambitious masterpiece, Shenmue. Released in November of 2000, it pushed the boundaries of graphics, presentation, and interactivity in video games. It is one of the finest pieces of software released on the system, if not the system's single greatest game. But its ingenuity and ambition came at a price. Plagued with an astronomical budget and having the rotten luck of being expected to save a failing system, the making of Shenmue is almost as remarkable as the game itself. Almost as remarkable. Thank god I'm the gaming historian. It'd be such a monumental task to both review this game and talk about its history. I mean, who's got time for that? So, with all this in mind, let's dive into the story behind one of the most immersive and ambitious games ever made, Shenmue. The history of Shenmue starts with the game's creator, Yu Suzuki. The brain behind many of Sega's hit arcade staples like Hang On, Afterburner, Virtual Racer, Virtual Cop, and one of the most successful series of all time, Virtual Fighter. It's easy to see why Yu Suzuki is commonly referred to as Sega's Shigeru Miyamoto. If it was a successful arcade game for Sega, chances are Mr. Suzuki had a hand in it. As a student, Mr. Suzuki played a lot of immersive and text-based RPG and adventure games on the Macintosh, most likely the Apple II. He said he had had an interest in evolving that kind of RPG, but into something quote, my RPG, but I might as well not call it an RPG. He liked the idea of the RPG, but wanted something less restrictive. This led him to create the idea of free, or fully reactive eyes entertainment. As Mr. Suzuki puts it, a fully reactive game with very sensitive eyes. I mean, can you believe that? Talk about ambition. Mr. Suzuki made his own damn genre for Shenmue. He set forth making one of the most ambitious and expensive games of all time. Nearly everything in the game could be looked at and inspected. Every character, no matter how mundane, had a speaking voice and could be approached and spoken to. This was achieved with realistic mouth movements and lip syncing for each of these characters, which was a huge step up from games like Metal Gear Solid. This meant the massive script was translated and re-recorded in English. Whole towns were constructed, filled with shops, restaurants, arcade machines, and people. People came and went, and shops opened and closed as each day progressed. The setting was in the 1980s, specifically November 86 to April 87, meaning you not only had a limited number of days to finish the game, everything right down to the behavior and clothing style of our hero was modeled after a mid-1980s Japan, allowing a level of cultural immersion never before seen in gaming, minus the Sega Saturn in the living room. There simply was not enough hours in the day to see everything Shenmue had to offer. A random weather simulator would shift from rain, snow, overcast, and sunny skies randomly for every game. Fighting sequences featured quick time events, or QTEs, so that complicated, high energy action sequences could be experienced seamlessly without directly controlling our hero. This was about five full years before God of War and Resident Evil 4. Other action sequences were similar to Virtual Fighter, but featured you fighting multiple opponents at once. And this was all done in real time, meaning no pre-rendered CG sequences like in Final Fantasy or Resident Evil. This allowed Mr. Suzuki to approach the game as if it were a movie, with stylish camera techniques and a fully orchestrated musical score. So successful was this cinematic approach, the game's cutscenes were strung together to make a feature-length movie released on DVD with the sequel. To make the game appealing to a broader audience, Mr. Suzuki produced a story that emphasized the importance of keeping friends, family, and loved ones close, and the ideas of courage and pride. They killed my father, right in front of me. I will have my revenge. This story had a sprawling 16 chapters to it, with the first game just serving as the first chapter. But it was quite a journey to see this vision fully realized. Shenmue started life sometime in 1994, when Mr. Suzuki went to China to do research for Virtual Fighter. It was there he got the idea of having a story set in China. At this time, Shenmue was to be Virtual Quest, an RPG based in the universe of Virtual Fighter, starring Akira. This was in the days of the Sega Saturn, when Virtual Fighter was at the height of its popularity. Development lasted for a little over two years, when in 1997 it was clear that the Saturn's days were numbered, and the game, then known to the press as Project Berkeley, was reworked for Sega's next system, which was then known as the Katana. 
Mr. Suzuki has stated that it was a painstaking process working on the notoriously difficult Saturn, but he was pleased with the results, proud of what he and his team were able to get out of the aging system. Much of what was developed during this time was used in the final game. For example, our hero Ryo still bears resemblance to Akira from Virtual Fighter, and though the Shenmue saga was to take place primarily in China, our hero doesn't get there until the second game. So, along with Sonic Adventure in D2, Shenmue was one of the first games developed for the Dreamcast. Shenmue was often used in early tech demos to show the Dreamcast's capabilities, building up hype and interest in Sega's next system. On a side note, Virtual Quest was completely re-envisioned and eventually released in Japan and North America for the PS2 and GameCube, two less than enthusiastic reviews. The Dreamcast was Sega's follow-up to the Saturn, which had been a disaster for Sega. Sega was eager to get back into the spotlight and the Dreamcast was their ticket. But video games had progressed immeasurably since they were a relevant force with the Genesis. I mean, games like Metal Gear Solid broke new ground with its advances in story and presentation. Games like Zelda The Ocarina of Time broke new ground with its massive scope and emphasis on exploration. Sega had some steep competition ahead of them. But Shenmue was poised to push all boundaries, but was understandably a difficult task for Sega, and Shenmue was not ready for launch with the system. The Dreamcast hit the US on 9999, where it was a financial and critical success, but right from the start it was also met with great speculation. The PS2 and the GameCube, which was then known as the Dolphin, were on the horizon. Sega was tearing up sales charts, but things were already starting to look grim. And if that wasn't bad enough, months before Shenmue came out in the US, Microsoft announced that it was throwing its hat in the ring with this thing called the Xbox. If the Dreamcast was going to have any long-term staying power, it would need something big, a game that could sell systems and show the world that Sega could run with Sony's PS2, Nintendo's GameCube, and Microsoft's Xbox. And the game to do it was Shenmue. The hype was crazy, the budget was crazy with a reported $70 million price tag. If there was a game that could save the Dreamcast, or at least keep things afloat until Sonic Adventure 2 shipped the following year, it was Shenmue. But it was not enough for Sega and its dying system. For all its technical and graphical achievements, the game had a very deliberately slow pace. It demanded commitment and lacked broad appeal. Mr. Suzuki had achieved his goal of making a simple yet beautiful and immersive experience, but many found the game to be downright boring. Shenmue was by no means a terrible game, but it was unrealistic to think that it could single-handedly save the system. It sold well, but not well enough to save the Dreamcast. Because of the looming launch of the PS2, the fate of the Dreamcast was sealed, and Shenmue was destined to fail. The writing was on the wall long before Shenmue was released. Another case of wrong place at the wrong time. It's interesting to note that almost exactly a year later, Grand Theft Auto 3 would hit the PS2, becoming a smash hit blockbuster and single-handedly changing gaming forever. Remember how cool it was in Grand Theft Auto 4 that you could walk into almost any building? Well, eight years earlier, you could go through their closets and kitchen cabinets. But as software sales showed, people were far more interested in gritty mafioso epics, driving across sprawling cities, and less about stories of courage, friendship, rummaging through someone's fridge, and driving a forklift. Video games are business and money talks. But that's not to say that Shenmue was a complete failure. Shenmue 2 came out a year later, representing chapters 3, 4, and 5 of the series. But this version was only released in Europe and in Japan. Americans would have to wait another year and experience it on the Xbox in 2002. And while the Xbox version has slightly better graphics, it's worth tracking down the PAL version because it has the option to play the game with Japanese voices and English subtitles. And it's super easy to play import games on the Dreamcast. However, Certain versions of the Xbox came with this really cool DVD, Shenmue the Movie. It actually strung together all the cutscenes of the first game into a surprisingly watchable 90 minute film. Shenmue was not a huge seller, but that isn't to say that it sold poorly, but sales for Shenmue 2 were much worse. By part 2, the series wasn't pulling the numbers to justify its enormous budget, which has pretty much sealed the fate of ever seeing a Shenmue 3. Shenmue was supposed to have 16 chapters, with chapters 1 through 5 being covered in the first two games. But that still leaves chapters 6 through 16. Sure, they had to wait for years for fan translations, but Earthbound fans got Mother 3, and Snatcher fans got Police Knots. Splatterhouse fans and Rockin' Out Adventure fans, they're getting their just desserts, but Shenmue fans, they got it worse than anyone. Every year it seems like somebody at Sega accidentally responds to a question about Shenmue 3, and Shenmue fans start understandably going crazy. What's the latest thing? Shenmue Hiro Ryo appearing as a character in Sega All-Star Racers. 
a positive sign of things to come or just fan service? Only time will tell. In the meantime, you should probably check out the Yakuza series, which is Sega's answer to GTA. Some could argue it's Shenmue done right from a commercial standpoint. Well, I think it's time we wrap things up. I still have a ton of papers I need to grade. So, this is The Gaming Historian saying thanks for watching another episode of The Gaming Historian. Thanks. Ah, I was grading papers with Shenmue on my desk? Didn't even make any sense. Ah. So, Mega Man 10 has arrived for the Xbox 360, the PS Triple, and of course, the Wii. But unlike last time, I wanted to take my time with this review. I didn't want to rush into things. I wanted to make sure that I was in the right state of mind for this review. And so, over the last month and a half, I've played a lot of Mega Man 10 and a lot of Mega Man 9, and I've come to this conclusion. If Mega Man 10 has done one thing, and one thing exceedingly well, it's made me appreciate even more what an amazing experience Mega Man 9 was. I'll admit that I was a little fanboyish, alright, really fanboyish, in my review of Mega Man 9, but I still stand by that review because it wasn't just the nostalgia talking, or the beer. What the hell? My rose-colored glasses are off now, and it's because of Mega Man 10's numerous but minor flaws, I realize how right Capcom got with Mega Man 9. Part 9 stands with the greatest Mega Man games, and though it is far from terrible, Mega Man 10 does not. The bosses are lamer this time, the weapons are lamer this time, that so bad it's good vibe just seems tired. The music isn't at all memorable, and the game seems unfairly difficult at times, as opposed to a carefully constructed, well-balanced difficult. Listen, my admiration for Capcom is still unmatched with any other developer today. And in case you're wondering, yes, I am looking forward to the possibility of a Mega Man 11, but it doesn't change this reality. Mega Man 10 is an absolute must download, but only after you download Mega Man 9 first. And once and for all, this is Mega Man 10, this is Mega Man X. This has always been Mega Man X. This was Mega Man X2, not Mega Man 12. The X stands for X, not 10. Sorry, that's always really bugged me. I'll, I'll calm down now. So Mega Man 10 proves once again that the Blue Bomber was best when he was 8-bit. Keep it simple, keep it 8-bit, and I'll keep playing. I know some people are crying out for a 16-bit remake, but to that I say go play Castlevania Rebirth, or Bionic Commander Rearmed. Personally, I like my Mega Man 8-bit. So Doc Wily is up to his old tricks again. <laughs> yeah, spoilers. And this is the first place that Mega Man 10 misses the mark. We have another cheesy story, which is to be expected, but this one is done completely straight. It's missing the tongue-in-cheek jokes of Mega Man 9, like Doc Wily giving a Swiss bank account number, that brief Chun-Li cameo, or self-deprecating lines like, haven't done this in a while. Even that joke at the very end after you beat Wily was pretty funny. And all these jokes drew you into the experience, and Mega Man 10 lacks this. Though I do like how 8-bit Mega Man has black hair, but anime Mega Man still has blue hair. Somewhere the Chapman brothers are laughing to themselves. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm a huge fan. But back to the story of Mega Man 10, the point I'm trying to make is this Robo Enza thing is completely ridiculous, but not really funny. It's played completely straight, and it comes across not as so bad it's good, but rather, um, are you even trying? It misses the point completely. You can't have a game with bosses like Sheep Man and Pump Man, and then honestly expect everyone to suspend their disbeliefs and go along with Robo Enza. Even the cutscenes between the levels are completely serious instead of lighthearted. Look, here's a scene from Mega Man 9. Oh, roll, you adorable little robot. Get down from there, you silly ghost. Oh my god, we're going out for ice cream. Come on, Scoops. Scoops! Now here's Mega Man 10. The, okay. Are we supposed to just laugh at how absurd this is, or are you really going for gripping drama here? This is Mega Man. The plot is Robo Enza. What are you thinking? Give me something to laugh at, or don't waste my time. But yeah, this is Mega Man, and for all intents and purposes, an NES game. We're not here for the story, we're here for the important parts. Ingenious level designs, tough bosses, cool weapons, and rockin' tunes. And does Mega Man 10 deliver? Not exactly. Let's 
start with the level design. Mega Man 10 definitely delivers. Each level has its own set piece, making for some brilliantly designed moments in brilliantly designed levels. The Sandstorms and Commando Man stage, the breakaway blocks of Ice and Chill Man stage, the disappearing color coordinated blocks of Sheep Man stage, the trucks on Nitro Man stage, the rocket soccer balls and Strike Man stage. Some of these levels have branching paths, others have awesome mini bosses. It's some great stuff, chock full of variation and challenge. Uh, a lot of challenge, actually. These aren't just some of the most well-designed levels, they're also some of the toughest. You know, people complain that Mega Man 9 was hard, but I'd argue that Mega Man 10 is harder. People could learn a lot by playing Mega Man 9 and Mega Man 10, because Mega Man 9 is the right way to do a hard game, but Mega Man 10 walks that dangerous line between a healthy challenge and hard to a fault. The levels are a bit unfair sometimes. They aren't as fine-tuned as Mega Man 9's, and I think the culprit is the easy mode. Each level had to not only be designed to work in normal mode, but also be adaptable into easy mode. It may have painted the level designers into a corner, but whatever the case, each level could have used a bit more polish, but they're still incredible. Not much to complain about here. Solid. And this is a good time to mention that I'm speaking as a Mega Man veteran. Mega Man's what got me into games in the first place. I've been playing them for a while, so I'm not interested in no easy mode. But for what it's worth, friends of mine who thought that Mega Man 9 was too hard told me they really enjoyed Mega Man 10 because of its easy mode. Which is great for the casual crowd, but not for veterans like me. Because I suspect this may have affected the overall experience a little, but... Uh, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's move on. Just like the story, the robot masters in Mega Man 10 lack that tongue-in-cheek approach that made Mega Man 9 so great. I don't have time to go over each one, so let's just compare each game's most controversial bosses. Mega Man 9's Splash Woman and Mega Man 10's Sheep Man. Splash Woman in and of herself was not very clever, but including her was a brilliant move. Splash Woman was the very first female robot boss, so including her broke the fourth wall. It was like Capcom was saying, yeah, the only female character we had in these games was Roll, and she was a cleaning bot, so sorry about this subtle bit of sexism in the last 20 years. We all heard this, and we all got it. It was another subtle, self-deprecating jab that drew you in, and made Mega Man 9 a little more enjoyable. Now, Mega Man 10 has Sheep Man. Yeah, Sheep Man. Not a cool animal like a snake or a toad, a sheep. But that's not right, because he's actually more like a lightning cloud. So is he a sheep or a cloud? How about a terrible idea, like just bad? I'm aware that he's most likely a reference to Philip K. Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? But if that's the case, that's quite a stretch, because I'm pretty sure most people only know that text as the inspiration for Blade Runner. Splash Woman was also bad, but existed for a reason. Her inclusion was actually quite clever and worked with the so bad it's good vibe. Sheep Man is just a reference to a science fiction classic, which I'll grant you is kinda clever, but not enough to actually elevate the game. He's just lame. He's almost pumped, man. He's dumb. Sorry, I just don't like him. I do have to give Capcom props for once again keeping the token Fire and Ice bosses interesting, so eh, no complaints over Chill Man and Solar Man. But overall, that so bad it's good thing only works once, so the Robot Masters in Mega Man 10 are a letdown. One thing Mega Man 9 did surprisingly well was made each weapon useful. Almost every weapon had a double usage. Tornadoes not only removed all enemies from screen, but gave you a bit of a boost. Concrete made tricky jumps easier, Hornet Buddies grabbed hard to reach items, even Galaxy Man's Black Hole could be made useful if you were clever enough. It was something pretty new for the original Mega Man series. Usually, weapons were just good against the robot masters, or crazy powerful. But trying to find the best way to utilize each weapon in Mega Man 9 made speedrunning really fun. But here, um, you can climb walls with the nitro cutter thing, you can freeze stuff with the chill spot, you can blow stuff up with crash bomb. Sheet Man's weapon is completely useless, I could never get that thing to help me. Even the weapon screen looks strangely empty. Mega Man 9 showed us that you can go the extra mile and make the weapons a little more interesting. It's a missed opportunity here. Okay, so so far we have a weak story with great level designs, but lame bosses and lame weapons. Which really isn't so bad, because the level design is the most important thing to the core gameplay. And if you remember, I enjoy the level design. But there is one huge, glaring problem with Mega Man 10. It has probably the weakest soundtrack in the entire series. One of the crowning achievements of Mega Man 9 was its soundtrack. I was humming Mega Man 9 tunes before the game even came out. Just that little bit of Tornado Man stage in the trailer was enough. And then once it came out, oh god, they were stuck in my head for months. 
This is not the case for Mega Man 10. There is not a single memorable melody among them. Tracks this time take a more ambient approach, achieving an appropriate melodic tone for each level. And while ambience and tone are important, without a strong melody to tie it all together, there's nothing particularly memorable about them. There are a couple of solid tracks like Nitro Man Stage or Blade Man Stage, but I wouldn't be able to hum them to you if you asked me. You may or may not have noticed that throughout this entire review, I've been using songs from other Mega Man games. I haven't used a single track from Mega Man 10 because the soundtrack is overall very weak, which is unacceptable for a Mega Man game. Tracks don't sound out of place, I mean they fit with the theme of each level, but that's like the only good thing I can say about them. Listen, I don't much care for Mega Man's 4, 5, and 6, but they at least had memorable songs. Mega Man games should have at least a couple melodies that stick to my brain like bubblegum tar. They achieved this with Mega Man 9, but completely failed with Mega Man 10. Unacceptable. Oh, and one quick thing. Why isn't there an option to turn off the weapon scroll for the Wiimote? It's convenient for a game like Cave Story, where you've only got a couple of weapons, but not here when you got like a dozen. Come on, no option to turn it off? Not one of your testers complained about this? I couldn't have been the only person who died a bunch of times because I accidentally switched weapons in the middle of battle. I know I can just use another controller, which I did do, and it's great for speedrunners, but it couldn't have been that hard to program an option. So a tired, boring story with great levels, but lame bosses, lame weapons, and a lame soundtrack. It's a bunch of little things that make the whole game a bit of a letdown. But what was the reason? Why did Mega Man 10 have all these shortcomings? So we can have more playable characters, more challenges, and more difficulty levels. As I'm sure you know, there is now an easy mode, as well as a normal mode and an unlockable hard mode. Proto Man is now playable from the start, and for a couple of points you can also buy base, too. Now unlike Mega Man, Proto Man can slide, charge, and though he takes more damage, has a shield that deflects bullets. Base can't slide, and by the way, it is base. Base can't slide, but can dash. He can also shoot rapid fire in 8 directions, though his attacks don't go through walls and are much weaker than his blue and red counterparts. Which, by the way, is exactly how he played in Rockman and Forte, aka Mega Man and Base. Ugh, just shut up. We got more challenges this time, which once again range from easy to holy shit, you've gotta have some kind of psychological disorder to want to wish you that. There's also another tier of challenges, kind of like the VR missions from Metal Gear. But all this extra stuff, it comes at a price, and no, I'm not talking Wii or Microsoft points. A lot of it feels tacked on or unnecessary. The extra challenges are neat, but only a few are actually any challenge. I tore through them in less than an hour and never looked back. Nothing special. Base and Proto Man are cool, but I found the game to still be the most fun with Mega Man. They were fun for a lark, but that's it. Mega Man 10 as a whole felt like a game that lacked polish in certain places, and I blame all this extra crap. Extra difficulty levels, extra characters, extra challenges, I get the sense that Capcom bit off more than they could chew. And the core gameplay suffered. I mean, I appreciate Capcom trying to give me more bang for my buck, even though I had to pay for most of this extra stuff, but good intentions don't a good game make. Capcom kept things simple with Part 9, and if there are plans for Part 11, I hope they do the same. Keep doing what you're doing, Capcom. Just keep that extra crap to a minimum. Focus on what's important, and trust me, challenges like these aren't important. Well, that's about all I got to say about Mega Man 10, but before I reach for my wine, allow me a brief moment to, um, cover my ass. In my review of Mega Man 9, I was passionately against the idea of badmouthing it. I was so happy that Capcom had given me a DeLorean ride back to my childhood that I didn't want to sound ungrateful. But now here I am, complaining about what a letdown Mega Man 10 was. Does that make me a hypocrite? Well, maybe, but a lot has changed since Mega Man 9 was first announced in the spring of 2008. Retro revivals are all over the place now. Splatterhouse, Rocket Knight, Blaster Master, Punch-Out, even obscure games like A Boy and His Blob, Klonoa, and Shantae are getting another go in the spotlight. The novelty is gone, and like I said earlier, I've taken my rose-colored glasses off. I now expect my retro throwbacks to do more than just tug at my inner child's heartstrings. So, do I take back the heaping mound of praise I gave Mega Man 9? Well, I might word things a little differently now, but no. My nostalgia may have gotten the best of me, but Mega Man 9 truly is one of the best Mega Man games this series has ever seen. It didn't just go through the motions, it hit all the right marks, but with Mega Man 10, it felt like Capcom was just going through the motions. It doesn't exactly make it a bad game, but just one that's not as good. Oh, and by the way, when I say more, I don't mean more challenges and playable characters. 
In early June of 2010, Capcom revealed that the much-talked-about Mega Man universe will in fact be an MMO. So it's possible that Capcom will finally put the cap on the series. And why not? 10's a good number to stop on. But if Mega Man 11 is on the way, all I can do is plead with Capcom to keep things simple. <sighs> but who am I kidding? Regardless of what Capcom puts out, I'll be the first in line to get my hands on the next Mega Man game. Even though I wasn't too impressed by Mega Man 10, I have to admit, I still have renewed faith and enthusiasm in this series. But my nerd DNA runs deep with Mega Man. Don't let me down, Capcom. Oh, sorry. I don't even have time for wine today. I've got to get started on the next review. You know which one it is. So, tell you what, I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Kenji Eno, the head of Warp Games, was at a Sony press conference, showcasing his new project, Enemy Zero, which was the follow-up and pseudo-sequel to his hit game, D. After a short preview of the game, the video finished proudly showcasing the Sony PlayStation logo. Then, in a move that perfectly exemplifies Kenji Eno's rebellious nature, the Sony PlayStation logo slowly morphed into the Sega Saturn logo. Yeah, the term burning bridges was coined for situations like this. Mr. Eno was apparently not pleased with the way Sony handled its port of D, producing only 28,000 copies when sales orders call for over 100,000. His response was essentially to tell Sony to go fuck themselves and to make his follow-up title, Enemy Zero, a Sega Saturn exclusive. Say what you want about his game, so Mr. Eno had balls. The history of Warp Games and Kenji Eno is a storied one, but again, it's one I do not have time for in this review. It's enough work reviewing the games, much less talking about the mad genius who made them. Kenji Eno, early in his gaming career, worked with many licensed characters and on many licensed games, and he has stated he hated doing that. He's a man who liked to do his own thing, and you can tell in D, Enemy Zero, and D2 that these are games that he wants to make. So right off the bat, you should know that these games are not for everyone. But you know what, I'm already wasting time. Let's get to it. This is Enemy Zero. The spacecraft Aki and her crew are returning back to Earth, having successfully completed their mission. Suddenly, the ship's emergency system is activated when some kind of alien creature breaks loose from the bowels of the ship, and the ship's crew are jolted out of cryogenic sleep. Our heroine Laura Lewis, that's Laura Lewis, not Laura Harris, receives a video call from fellow crew member Parker, just in time to watch in horror as an alien creature savagely attacks and kills him. Shortly thereafter, it is revealed there is an untold number of these aliens prowling the ship. How did these creatures get aboard the ship and what exactly are they? Will Laura be able to save the rest of her crewmates? Will she be able to save herself? It's fair to call Enemy Zero D one and a half, because half the game plays exactly like D. Indoor sequences are restricted to an invisible rail, where Laura moves on a predetermined path until she stops at an invisible intersection. Most of the story and the dialogue sequences happen in these parts. They're rather subdued, but work well in creating a powerful sense of anxiety and isolation. Personally, I really like the slow pace and the mood it sets. The other half of the game is also played in the first person, but gives you complete control. You'll spend the majority of your time running through dimly lit winding corridors battling the extremely deadly alien creatures. Unfortunately, these action sequences are both the best and worst part of Enemy Zero. As I'm sure you know, the creatures that plague the ship are invisible, so you must depend on a piano chime to locate them. It's important you tread carefully because they don't hurt you, they kill you instantly. Luckily, this is kill or be killed, since they go down with only one hit, too. But the guns you have at your disposal shoot extremely short range, meaning you must be literally inches away from these creatures to take them down. So don't miss. Oh, and by the way, your gun takes a few moments to charge, and if you charge for too long, 
it'll burn out. So not only do you need to get extremely close to the invisible enemies that kill you instantly, you have to time your shots just right. Fail, and it's game over. The tension is incredible. It could be canned and sold wholesale. Right down to the very end of the game, I was never not on the edge of my fucking seat, and I was never not completely satisfied and relieved when I successfully killed one of these things. Turn off the lights, crank up the sound, and get ready to have the absolute shit scared out of you. Or be ready to yell, I'll fuck you and your stupid worthless gun, Kenji Eno. For as amazing and heart pounding as the combat is, it also makes Enemy Zero an extremely difficult game. Imagine Fatal Frame, which you can only shoot right before a ghost strikes you, and if you miss, it's game over. Now, do it blind, working with audio cues only. It's freaking hard. The timing is something I got used to, but the correct distance was always difficult to gauge. My frustration reached its peak near the end of the game when you had a long sequence of labyrinths, and you had to kill about five or six creatures without a break. It was both one of the most frightening sequences in video game history, and one of the most frustrating. So for as much as I did enjoy these action sequences, they didn't need to be this hard. But what's the big deal? You've got unlimited ammo and continues, right? <laughs> Not exactly. If all this wasn't bad enough, each of your guns quickly runs out of juice and needs to be constantly be charged. So if you miss too many times, you might suddenly find yourself defenseless. Furthermore, your voice recorder, aka the thing that saves your game, also has a limited battery life, but can't be recharged, and it costs energy to both save and load your game. So if you die because you fired your gun a moment too soon or too many times and ran out of juice, loading your game is going to cost you. There's no getting around the fact that Enemy Zero is incredibly unforgiving. But hold on there, things aren't so bad. Contrary to what your crew members say and how they move in the cutscenes, the creatures actually move very slowly. They seem to wander around aimlessly, never actively seeking you out. I'd say about half the creatures in this game can be circumvented, and quite easily since your tracker has enormous range. Once you get a feel for how your tracker works, it's easy to get a beat on a creature and then find another way around. I also highly recommend you pop in Disc Zero. <laughs> yeah, I know, really clever, right? And practice on the training mode. Second, I recommend playing on either Easy or Beginner. On Easy, you start with 99 battery life instead of 64, and your guns last a little longer. Now, saving still costs 4 points and loading still costs 2, but it actually makes things pretty balanced and brings the game down to a manageable difficulty. And just because the game spans 3 discs doesn't mean it's super long requiring tons of saves. Remember, there's a lot of CGI here. I died a few times in the beginning, but after I got the hang of things, it was smooth sailing until that marathon segment late in the game, but by then you get a gun that never runs out of energy, so that's good. And though I died a lot on that final stretch, I still beat the game with dozens of points to spare. And if you still find yourself intimidated, there's no shame in playing on beginner, where your recorder also has 99 battery life but only takes one charge to save and load. Also, you never have to recharge your guns on beginner, they all have unlimited ammo. I've beaten Enemy Zero on both Easy and Beginner, and nothing about the ending changes, and only an extremely minor, pretty much incidental thing changes about the story. Well, I guess the one difference is if you beat the game on Normal, you unlock HARD MODE, where there's more creatures, less battery life, and even fewer charges for your gun! Fuck you, no thanks. Ooh, there's a bonus shower scene when you play on Hard. What am I, in 7th grade? Still not interested. And did Kenji Eno hide this scene from the censors too? How the hell did that guy keep getting teen-rated games? I guess this is another semi-morality crisis, like depending on online facts. But if you can live with playing on easy, then Enemy Zero is a very fun challenge, albeit still very unforgiving. Kenji Eno is a man that not so much knows how to write a good story, but he definitely knows how to tell one. For example, if I told you the whole story to D, explaining everything, you'd probably say, that's it? Doesn't sound so great. Because it was the way he spoon-fed the details to you through cryptic messages from your father and the fragmented images from Laura's subconscious. And the same thing applies with Enemy Zero. The story itself isn't all that. In fact, it's an obvious amalgamation of many science fiction classics. It's still expertly told. Mr. Eno masterfully creates a setting with the spaceship Aki and quickly establishes her crew's dilemma. He slowly reveals the truth of what's really going on and then throws in a couple of curveball twists that completely change everything. 
Again, if I explain the whole plot here for you, you'd be missing the experience of watching these events unfold in front of you. Just like with D, Enemy Zero is not a game to be spoiled. A lot of the strength from the story comes from its characters, especially the main protagonist, Laura. Again, she's not Laura Harris from D, she's Laura Lewis this time. She is once again a silent protagonist, though she is still very believable as a person because she reacts to things the way a human being ought to. Let me explain. In Resident Evil, it always bugged me when you would pick up a file or a picture that revealed some huge plot twist, but your character seemed to be completely unaware of what they just saw. For example, I think everyone knows the big plot twist at the end of the first Resident Evil, which was revealed more or less when a character you've known the whole game suddenly appears in a photograph. Now instead of your character going like, holy fuck, what's he doing in this photograph? They're completely unaffected, and it takes you out of the game when your character doesn't react to a bombshell of a plot point. It was so satisfying to stumble upon a really big plot twist in a document in Enemy Zero and see Laura fall to her knees in complete shock, reacting like an actual person. Again, she never speaks, but when the shit hits the fan, she responds like a genuine human being. I was able to accept that maybe she's just a shy, quiet woman, not someone who doesn't talk because it's convenient for the storyteller, though that may have been the reason. In D, Laura never spoke, but that's just how the game was designed. The only speaking role was Laura's father, who, as a matter of fact, only spoke in the English version. In the Japanese version, it was all text. Here, they made an attempt to give our heroine a soul instead of a voice, which I personally found made her easier to sympathize with. Though, technically, Laura does have a voice. Voice record number 013, Laura Lewis. And though these parts are excellently performed by Luscious Jackson frontwoman Jill Kunif, they're only inner monologues recounting recent developments in the story and are dictated in an appropriate monotone. It's convenient for people resuming old games and a pretty cool feature but doesn't build Laura's character or draw you more into the story. Of course, this is of no fault to Mrs. Kunif's performance. For a character that, as far as the story goes, never speaks, she's still incredibly well-developed and believable. Given the state of voice work during the early PlayStation and Sega Saturn days, it was definitely a smart move to have the lead character remain silent. Enemy Zero not only has a great story, but a lot of story, most of it told through cutscenes of characters physically speaking to each other. And much like most games that came out in the mid to late 90s, the voice work here is really bad, but not all of it. The actor who voiced Kimberly must be singled out, as she stands head and shoulders above everyone else. Parker! Oh please, Parker! Oh yeah, and before some of you start reading too deep into this game, saying, Oh jeez, how typical. The black guy not only dies first, but dies in the opening cinema before the game even starts. Well, the black girl becomes one of the story's most important characters and gets a ton of screen time. And they found a damn good actor to play her, so shut up. The voice work is a mixed bag, but two of the three lead characters were completely believable, and I very much enjoyed the story all the way to the end. And for a game this old, two out of three ain't bad. The game also keeps things interesting by having a number of awesome puzzles to bridge the gaps between story development and fighting aliens. So get ready to take a few notes. But I had a few minor issues. Much like in D, halfway through Enemy Zero there's a sequence that drags on a little too long. The game opens up, giving you a bunch of places to explore, but with little to no direction. It's not game ruining, but it's a very noticeable section where game progress stalls. Another issue is the very first puzzle you encounter. I don't know what the hell they were thinking here, but the solution to this puzzle is never actually given to you. Without any indication, you're supposed to just guess the solution all by yourself. That's a horrible way to start a game. Like, how is I supposed to know you gotta figure it out all on your own? But now you know, so no complaining. And one must mention the music. Kenji Eno is many things, including a very accomplished musician. For example, all the music in D was written and performed by him. The dude is a mutant. But Enemy Zero features a score written by accomplished composer Michael Nyman, who is best known for writing the score to the 1993 award-winning drama The Piano, winning himself a Golden Globe and BAFTA nomination for his contribution. I wasn't too surprised to find out that a Hollywood-level composer was responsible for the music in this game because it's incredible. But how Mr. Eno got him to do the soundtrack is actually a pretty funny story. To quote from his interview with 1UP.com, there was a big earthquake in Kobe, Japan in 1995, and Michael Nyman was donating pianos to schools in the city. Later, he said he wanted to check out how the pianos were doing, so he came to Japan. 
When I found out, I invited him to my hotel room and tried to convince him for six hours to come work with me. So at the end, Michael was like, okay, I'll do it. Just let me go back to my room. We didn't work out terms or conditions. He just said he would do it. And one last thing, Aiko and Shadow of the Colossus director Fumito Ueda got his start as an animator for Enemy Zero. Though according to that same interview, he wasn't with Warp Games for very long. And Mr. Eno doesn't take any credit for his success. Quote, I handpicked him because I saw his potential, but it's not like I groomed him or anything. He already had talent when he came to work. So in closing, Enemy Zero is an interesting little horror gem. It has its flaws, and just like with D, some will be able to overlook these flaws and others will not. But it's worth mentioning that even though D came out on three different consoles, Enemy Zero only came out on the Saturn. So if you're a diehard Sega Saturn fan, there is no reason you shouldn't own this game. Now, we're almost done with the D Trilogy. We've got one last game to talk about, which is, of course, D2 for the Dreamcast. I'll see you soon. Cheers. the D Trilogy came to a close with D2 for the Dreamcast. And much like the first D and its Sega Saturn pseudo-sequel Enemy Zero, D2 was a bit of a watershed game. Not exactly perfect, it's a very unique game whose crazy ideas work more than they don't. It is a stunningly beautiful game by Dreamcast standards, an excellent spin on typical survival horror conventions, and features first-rate voice work, but is marred by an awkwardly paced, sometimes directionless story that above all, far overstays its welcome. Everything else is creative and engaging, but that story? And you thought Kojima was long-winded. D2 once again showcases that Kenji Eno was, and is, truly one of the great creative minds in video games, but it is somehow both the most and least accessible entry in the trilogy. It is the same level of flawed genius we expect from Mr. Eno, but while previous entries had their flaws, those were design choices, necessary evils. The narrative of D2 feels like a genuine misstep. A must-have for horror and Dreamcast enthusiasts, but at times is difficult to recommend to all gamers. As I mentioned in my review of D, D2 started life as the flagship title for Panasonic's M2, which was to be the successor to its marginally successful 3DO. This version of D2 was to be a direct sequel to D, though instead involving Laura Harris's son. It was allegedly 50% finished when Panasonic canceled plans to release its next system. Luckily, Warp Games had established a solid relationship with Sega, who at the time was developing the next system, the Dreamcast. Kenji Eno decided to completely scrap the previous game and start from scratch with Sega's new system. So, along with Shenmue and Sonic Adventure, D2 was among the first games developed for the Dreamcast. However, it wasn't released until late August of 2000, almost one year after the system had been released. Laura Parton, no, not Laura Harris or Lewis, Parton, is traveling on a plane fighting to stay awake. Laura goofs around with the kids sitting in the seat in front of her and strikes up a conversation with the men across Morale, when the plane is suddenly taken over by terrorists, who seem to be working for a mysterious old man performing what looks like a seance. Oh, and if you watch closely, the in-flight movie is actually footage from the scrapped version of D2. Things go from bad to worse when a meteor strikes the plane, sending it crashing down into a desolate Canadian mountain. Laura wakes up in a cabin, miraculously unharmed, makeup still intact, thanks to the help of HEY IT'S KIMBERLY FROM ENEMY ZERO! She starts to explain what's happened since the plane crash when a man bursts in and starts violently sprouting plant-like tentacles that attack Kimberly and... Yep, stay classy, Japan. But her heroines are saved by HEY IT'S PARKER! And he's kicking some ass instead of dying off in the opening cinema like he did in ENEMY ZERO. This is where we find out that Kimberly is a pretty conflicted woman, and the game and its story officially begin. 
It's a rather long opening that kicks off a promising story, both deep and fascinating, that unfortunately ends up being the game's most glaring flaw. Here's how I imagined it went down. Kenji Anno released D in Enemy Zero and was fittingly applauded by critics for his storytelling abilities. Then, a little game called Metal Gear Solid came out, and Mr. Anno said, Hey, I can do that too! Ditching a more minimalist structure like Boo! Haunted Castle or Boo! Space Aliens! D2 was much more than just a plane crash in green, plant-like aliens. It attempts to make broad statements about the errors of mankind and the flaws of human nature, illustrate the effects of substance abuse, demonstrate the stages and struggles of an existential crisis, and ask sobering questions about the concepts of identity and destiny. The story is very deep, going places philosophically few games have ever gone before. In typical Kenji Anno style, he has taken the road less traveled. I have no doubt that hidden in this mess of a story is a profound message, but I couldn't be bothered to search for one. The story lacks cohesion and at times can't decide which message it's trying to enlighten you with. It's simply too much. Though when discussing a story of this depth and ambition, there's no accounting for taste, so it's fair to argue these claims. But even if you did enjoy the story, you gotta admit, it could have been trimmed way down. I mean, a bad story I can forgive, but when it starts to overstay its welcome, it hurts the game. Kojima makes this shit look easy. As far as the problems with the narrative, the biggest culprit is our heroine, Laura. She is once again a silent protagonist, and though that worked fine in D and Enemy Zero, it's no longer working here. The story has just far too much shit going on this time, and if Laura were able to talk to the other people, it would have helped things immeasurably. Hey, you're awake, what happened to you? I don't know, I can't remember anything. Hi, my name is Laura. Oh, hi, Laura, I'm Kimberly. I need your help to get the fuck out of here. No problem, thanks for giving me shelter. I'm with you, friend. Let's get the fuck out of here. Oh, shit, ah! Instead, we have long sequences where characters rattle on and on and on, and these sequences aren't engaging because usually, Laura's just sitting there listening. She hardly contributes to anything, and as far as story progression goes, she's like a stowaway. She might as well be Wilson. Actually, Laura does finally break her silence, but it's literally four words. I think during these moments I was supposed to be moved and shocked. I was neither. This mute lead character approach worked especially well in Enemy Zero because Laura was actively pushing the story forward, contributing to the plot. Here, people talk, she listens, things happen and they say, What do you say, Laura? Can you help? These lengthy dialogue scenes try really hard to get me to care about what's happening, and it did for a while, but by the time the credits started to roll, I had checked out hours ago. If they had caved and finally given Laura a voice, maybe it would have sped things along. To be fair, the amount of dialogue sequences never changed through the four discs, but things start to pick up after disc one. The first disc is definitely the most boring. Things start to get really interesting on disc two, but by the time disc three rolls around, the story has taken an odd turn and starts getting all philosophical. We spend much more time with characters venting introspectively, and crazy shit like the plane crash and the plant creatures aren't really discussed anymore. Not to mention, they keep introducing new characters, providing backstory that's seldom important, only to kill them off sometimes later that very cutscene. Things like the plane crash and the plant creatures are explained, but not in as much detail as, say, Kimberly's past. In fact, I think by the end of the game, I knew most not about Laura, Parker, the green monsters, the plane crash, but about Kimberly's tragic upbringing and life story. Yeah, 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 you had a rough childhood, but there's plant aliens all over this mountain. Is this really the best time to be having an existential crisis? Why don't you shut up, grab a gun, and help me get us the fuck out of here? Enemy Zero and D were amazing pieces of storytelling, but unfortunately, Mr. Eno dropped the ball on this one. It's really upsetting that the story is so bad because nearly everything else is great. This may surprise you to hear this, but the dialogue scenes are actually well written and very well voiced. Yeah, characters ramble on and on, but the actual dialogue ain't bad. And more importantly, that voice work is top notch. Though the lip sync is atrocious, this ain't Shenmue. Must be lost along with the other passengers from the crash. <sighs> Shitty lip sync was the norm back then, so it's forgiven. And though the content of the story is more weird than scary, I'd still classify D2 as survival horror. But then again, this is Warp Games, so of course D2 has its own approach to survival horror. For people who enjoyed Resident Evil 4 but can't stand the controls of older Resident Evil games, might squirm in their seats to discover that Laura controls in that familiar tank style, where up always moves you forward and left and right always rotates you. Now, I for one have never had a problem with the tank controls, but agree they shouldn't have stayed a staple of the genre for as long as they did. 
D2 fixes this mistake by having combat take place in the first person. This not only brings a really cool RPG mechanic to the game, it saves the game from horrible combat spoiled by slow movement and awkward camera angles. It also makes the boss battles a hell of a lot more interesting. There's even aspects of quick time events. You could argue that Resident Evil 4 was very much inspired by D2. Then again, D2 was probably inspired by Parasite Eve. This does give the game random battle syndrome, but moments are typically brief and fun. It works more than it doesn't. But this is survival horror, and if you're gonna survive, you'll need an ample amount of ammo and health supplies. But since combat is all random battles, things are balanced with weapons that have both limited and unlimited ammo. You start the game with an Uzi that you just find in a cupboard, and though it's the weakest weapon, it has unlimited ammo. Shotguns and handguns have limited ammo, but pack more firepower and accuracy that help when you're in a pinch or battling a tough boss. You eventually get a semi-automatic rifle that replaces the Uzi, though it's still nothing on that shotgun. Ammo is scattered all over the game, but this makes these standard on-rails indoor sequences finally engaging. If you spot a box of ammo or some first aid spray, hold down the Y button, look at it, and you'll automatically pick it up and add it to your inventory. Keep a sharp eye, because there's stuff hidden everywhere. And while you're at it, check out the detail of the world around you. It's a damn pretty game. So you have a few guns with unlimited ammo, but you have to depend on first aid sprays to keep your health up? Nah, there's another way to replenish your health. Hunting. Your first weapon is actually a hunting rifle, though you never use it in battle. Instead, as you explore the mountain, you'll come across game to kill, like caribou and hare. Successfully shoot one and you'll be rewarded with some meat. Now meat doesn't replenish nearly as much health as first aid sprays, but I don't think there's any limit to the amount of game you can carry. This hunting mechanic not only keeps things balanced in the presence of random battles, it's actually a clever way to make you appreciate how beautiful this game is. Play this game for a while and you'll start squinting at any black dot just over the horizon. Wait a minute, is that a bunny? Oh, it's just a fence post sticking out of the snow. I wanted to kill a bunny. Yeah, this game will totally bring out the cold-hearted predator in you. But hunting isn't as easy as you'd think. This isn't Halo. Your rifle controls pretty realistically, especially when you're fully zoomed in. There's a lot of game to score out there, but you gotta earn it. But don't worry, you got unlimited ammo with this thing too. Though I do love this piece of video game logic. You can put the game you caught in this portable cooker. It automatically cleans and cooks the meat. Sure it does. So you can eat whenever you're hungry. It's pretty good. Wait a minute, how exactly is something that complicated portable? Where is Laura keeping that thing? Oh well. I've said for a Dreamcast game, D2 is absolutely beautiful, but its crowning achievement is the Canadian mountain. Snowfalls and tree branches and lights sway and bob in the wind. Wild animals populate the mountain and frolic and flee when they hear the sound of footsteps or the sound of a rifle. Cabins and fences are buried in snow and caked with ice, emphasizing the presence and power of nature. As the game progresses, so does the weather, from daytime, sunset, and nightfall. Warp did an exceptional job creating a snow-covered mountain that feels isolated and unforgiving. This mountain is alive and real. It's really a shame there wasn't like a body temperature mechanic. That's how realistic it feels. I was actually worried if Laura was wearing enough clothes to stay warm. And I've already mentioned the indoor buildings and cabins. After you've collected your ammo and first aid spray, check out how meticulously decorated they are. The interior of the plane wreckage is especially impressive too. However, why is this poor deceased woman missing her pants? Stay classy, Japan. There's one sequence where you use a flashlight and a mine shaft and the lighting effects are great. The characters and enemies are all amazingly detailed, but again, the creatures are more weird looking than scary. D2 doesn't just look good, but at times feels real. I played my share of survival horror games, so I know the importance of being conservative with your ammo and health supplies. So by the time I got to the end boss of D2, I had so much firepower and first aid sprays, he didn't stand a chance. And I was ready to declare this a disappointment. And then it occurred to me, I've had the exact same problem with Silent Hill and Resident Evil. In fact, most every survival horror game I played had this problem. The final boss was a total pushover because I'd spent the whole game rationing my health items and ammo. But I must be mentioned that that final push to the last boss of D2 was far and away the toughest struggle of the game, sometimes bordering on cheap. Item management is also something missing, but it's something I can't hold against D2 because of the random battles. It's a necessary evil I can overlook, and besides, this RPG approach to survival horror is really cool. And with that, we've completed the D trilogy, so let's recap things. D was great, but short. Enemy Zero was also great, but really hard. 
D2 was unique, beautiful, and a ton of fun, but gah, that story. Do you see a pattern? But Warp and Kenji Anno made the games they wanted to make, and the games they wanted to make were always unconventional. The D trilogy was not made with everyone in mind. And even though each of these games had their flaws, they're still unlike anything else out there. Though I'll concede that D2 felt to me that it was long-winded and desperately grasping for a cohesive message, there's no accounting for taste. Some people thought No Country for Old Men was boring. I thought it was brilliant. On the other hand, I think 2001 is awful, while others see it as a perfect piece of cinema. Maybe you'll enjoy the story to D2 more than I did, especially now that you know what to expect. Regardless, my point is this. The D trilogy may be an imperfect one, but it is still one that demands your attention. They will challenge your perception of storytelling, and they will challenge your perception of how a video game ought to be structured. And in the end, this is the trilogy's greatest achievement. Well, I'm done with the D trilogy, but I'm not done with Halloween. Up next, I got a Halloween game for the ages. See you soon. Cheers. Sweet Home is often considered to be the great granddaddy of the modern survival horror game, and is one of the better known Famicom games to never be released in North America. But it's not just that one game that was too gory or violent for North America, it's also an absolute masterpiece. As a turn-based RPG, it has aged better than any other on the system by going against tradition. As a survival horror game, many of the common conventions of the genre were birthed and nearly perfected in Sweet Home. As a piece of horror fiction, it is genuinely dark and scary, with probably the most shocking and unsettling moments in an NES game. Yeah, Chiller and Wampaka Graffiti? You ain't got nothing. In short, Sweet Home is as brilliant as it was trailblazing. You may have heard of this game, but you never thought it was this good. Because I thought I'd seen it all. I thought I knew the NES, but I hadn't seen anything. I hadn't played Capcom's horror masterpiece, Sweet Home. The history behind Sweet Home is, of course, that it was based on a cheesy Japanese movie. And at the time I made this video, the movie was up on YouTube, so I gave it a watch. And it's pretty good, you know, nothing spectacular. Now, I'm not sure which came first, the movie or the game, but I suspect the movie took longer to make, and since both were released on the same day, the idea of Sweet Home probably first started as a movie, meaning Sweet Home is technically a licensed game. And since the game was more enjoyable than the movie, if you ask me at least, it means this is one of the very, very few licensed games that is not just really good, but in fact better than the license it's based on. Again, that's not to say the movie was awful, it was just very... Eh. But if I can make a recommendation, play the game first because they more or less tell the same story. So watching the movie first will spoil a lot of the really good scenes in the game. The movie is really nothing special, and had it not been for the game, nobody will be talking about it except hardcore movie nerds. But I'm not a movie nerd, I'm a video game nerd, so let's get to the game. Sweet Home was released in Japan on December 15th, 1989, and was never released anyplace else, and I doubt there were ever plans to. The story goes, the North American censors got their hands on the game and just went, are you kidding? And rejected the game outright, which is absolutely no surprise. And keeping in mind how strict Nintendo's censors were back in the late 80s, there is absolutely no way they could have cleaned this game up for America. They would have had to change everything. And even today, if this game were to find its way to virtual console, which if you're wondering is extremely unlikely, it would most likely get an M for mature rating. Or at least it should, not just for the violence and the gore, but the tone and content of the story. 
Once the story starts to unfold, some very heavy and quite frankly shocking things come about. The producers of Sweet Home made exactly the game they wanted to make, and it's a better game because of it. Yeah, there's no way this game could have ever come out in America. Though I can't help but wonder what Wisdom Tree would have done to Sweet Home if they'd gotten their hands on it. Pardon the pun, but holy shit, I'd play that game in a heartbeat. But then, how exactly am I playing this game? Well, just so everyone knows, I'm playing Sweet Home on what is called a reproduction cartridge. Furthermore, I'm playing a fan-translated version of the game. Since it was never released outside of Japan, it has no official translation. Essentially, I'm playing a translated ROM hack placed on a blank NES cartridge, so nothing about what I'm playing was officially released by Nintendo of America. This being said, when you start a new game, you're given the option to change your party's names, and I highly recommend changing them to something more familiar. You'll understand why in a minute. At this point in the review, I should mention the story. But you know, I went into this game only knowing that it was too hot for American eyes. And that's how it should be. The less you know, the better. So here's a very brief synopsis. A film crew travels to the desolate Mamiya Mansion to document and preserve the late painter Ichiro Mamiya's collection of frescoes. But it's rumored to be haunted by the ghost of his late wife, Lady Mamiya. Undaunted, our hero's going anyway. And of course, find out that it is indeed haunted by the ghost of Lady Mamiya the second they enter the giant mansion. And telling you any more would only spoil the experience. The story isn't so much about your party, but is rather your party piecing together the horrific events that took place in the mansion many years ago. This means there aren't long dialogue scenes or even character development within your party. Instead, you have to piece most of the plot together from hidden messages in frescoes, Ichido Mamiya's journal entries, and messages from recently and not so recently slain corpses littered throughout the mansion. Think of it like all the files and newspaper clippings you collect in Resident Evil. And the story is well paced, too. At first, Sweet Home supplies you with helpful hints and direction, but once you got the hang of things, the story takes an abrupt and dark turn, announcing the shit has officially started. And since this is an NES game, they gotta keep their shit concise. It pulls no punches and wastes no time. It's great. Now, I've already mentioned that Sweet Home definitely has its... Whoa! Moments. Whoa! And I'm sure a lot of you aren't convinced. Whoa! Sure, this is an NES game, but this is an NES game! You thought Hitler's head exploding was graphic? Trust me, I could show you some shit. And I'm not just talking about that one video you may have seen on YouTube, which by the way, if you have, you're completely missing the context if you haven't actually played the game. It's way more fucked up if you don't understand what's actually happening. It's also one of the most memorable scenes in the game, and one that should not be spoiled. So do me a favor, just stay off of YouTube. Play the game and just stay off of YouTube. Besides, it's not the gory bits, of which there are a few, that are scary. It's more the grim tone and content of the story. I'm prepared to be taken aback and disturbed when I play a horror game on Xbox or PlayStation, but a game on the NES? I'm completely out of my element here. There were many times where I had to look down at my hands just to reassure myself I was in fact playing an NES game. It's maybe the only game on the system whose story completely arrested my attention, or I kept playing because I just had to know what was going on and what was going to happen next. It may not be one of video games' all-time great pieces of storytelling, but it may be the system's definitive piece of storytelling. Clash at Demon Head, Golgo 13, Crystalis, Deja Vu all have great stories, sure, but they never reach the impressive level of cohesiveness and allure of Sweet Home. The story is great, but I wouldn't dare spoil any of it. Just take my word for it. It's a fun, scary good time. But we all know that story and setting don't make a game. If a game ain't fun to play, is it going to be any fun at all? So is Sweet Home fun to play? <laughs> Get comfortable. Sweet Home is an experience unlike anything else on the system. In Sweet Home, you have five people in your party, each with their own special item. I think some are stronger than others, but I went through the whole game without ever really worrying about it. What's far more important are the special items, because the mansion is littered top to bottom with hazards and puzzles. Locked doors need keys, debris needs to be cleared, and of course, frescoes need to be preserved. Furthermore, there's a ton of extra items that anyone can pick up and swap. Planks of wood to cross over chasms with, oh buddy, watch your step, candles to aid you in the dark, gloves that help you crawl through thorny bushes, and so on. But as I'm sure you've noticed, you can't travel with all five members at once. The most your party can hold is three. You not only need to manage your items, but also two separate parties. Which means you've got to decide which two are traveling alone. And there's no real right combination either. Should the photographer stick with the key holder since many of the frescoes are behind locked doors? 
Or since there's so many locked doors, should the key holder stick with the medic just in case they get poisoned or cursed? But sometimes the frescoes are covered in dust and can't be photographed. So should the photographer stick with the vacuum guy. If you change your mind, you can change your party, just as easy as you swap items. Ah, crap, I need a rope. Now who did I leave that with? Ah, damn it, I left it with those guys, and they're downstairs. It's a remarkable amount of strategy for an NES game. But let's not forget that Sweet Home is primarily an RPG, but damn it, it nails that too. It's sad to say that even though Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior are two of the most important RPGs ever made, they sure as hell are boring, aren't they? All that grinding? I don't know how the hell I played these games as a kid. Yes, they're classics, but man did these games age poorly. But just like with Earthbound, Sweet Home deviates from many typical RPG conventions, making it the best aged turn-based RPG on the system. Sweet Home takes place in a haunted mansion. This of course means there are no towns. Progress is never impeded because you need to tread back to town to rest up at the inn. And don't expect any safe rooms or magical warps either. You are stuck in that mansion. But this means a number of things. One, no talking to the king to record your progress. You can save anytime, anywhere. Two, the game is therefore pretty much always moving forward, which makes it addicting. Three, no weapon shops. All weapons are found lying around the mansion. And since there's no shopping to be done, four, enemies don't give you money, just experience. So five, if you're going to grind, it's just to raise your levels. Now it is important you keep on that grind, but with no ends, how are you supposed to heal? Tonics are found throughout the mansion, and they instantly heal everyone in your party 100% regardless of your levels. That may sound a little too convenient, but remember, you can't buy tonics. You have to ration the handful littered throughout the mansion. There's that item management again. But if this sounds like a deal breaker, don't worry. To be honest, I was never sweating over tonics. Another great thing about Sweet Home is how it streamlines the random battles. Battles are typically quick because you never fight more than one enemy. Another subtle thing is there's no death animation or fanfare for winning a battle. Once your foe has been vanquished, the text announces you've earned this much experience and boom, you're back on the overworld. Like all old school RPGs, Sweet Home suffers from random battle syndrome, but it does a damn good job of making this staple of the genre as painless as possible. Now just because you never fight more than one enemy at a time, doesn't mean you should ever have a party member travel alone. Throughout the game, increasing more so as you progress, enemies love to poison and curse party members. Early on, enemies will stun a party member, and though this doesn't affect them after battle, during battle their health quickly depletes. Later enemies will curse and poison, which depending on the creature, will either paralyze you during or sometimes after battle. Either way, if you don't treat their illness quickly, they'll be dead in no time. Nah, but what's the big deal? If they die, just bring them back with a phoenix down or something, right? No problem, right? Wrong. If a party member dies, they're dead. For good. You cannot bring them back. And their special item? Also gone. Sweet Home doesn't fuck around. Hope you got an empty slot to carry the replacement item. It is very important you stick together and keep your medic nearby. Also, if your medic becomes cursed, any character can run up and use her med pack on her, which is some smart programming by Capcom. So watch your party's HP closely, but remember, there's only so many tonics to go around. But this tendency to curse and poison can work in your favor. Let's say you get into a fight and the enemy is only able to attack once before you clobber them. And if all they do is curse you, it's no big deal if you got your medic around. Just heal them as soon as the curse sets in and everything goes back to good. Nobody loses any HP and it's like the fight never happened. So stay sharp and you should be ready for when the unexpected happens. Because there's more than just random battles to contend with. Oh yes, this house is alive and it's hungry. Collapsing floors? Check. Sticky floors? Check. Ice pits? Check. Water traps? Check. Fire traps? Check. Possessed chairs? Knives? Statues? Chandeliers? Check. And probably the biggest threat, lost souls that'll snatch up a party member and place them somewhere else in the mansion. Later in the game, enemies start doing this in the midst of battle, which really fucks with your plans. Did I mention you can save anytime, anywhere, and you should save often? So let's recap. You've got to deal with managing your party, managing your items, especially tonics, be ready for poison and curses, as well as random battles and a bevy of traps and hazards. In a nutshell, take Final Fantasy or Dragon Warrior, streamline random battles, trim the grinding way down, 
add puzzles, hazards, and traps, and replace weapon and armor customization with party and item management. And suddenly, you have a 20-year-old RPG that is never boring. Wrap it all together in a dark, sometimes genuinely scary atmosphere, and you've got a goddamn classic. An absolute must-play. Technically speaking, Sweet Home is also an excellent title. The graphics are top-notch for an NES game from 1989. The many monsters are all disgustingly detailed. Mr. Grasping Hands and Vomiting Head gets me every time. Ugh, get it off. And if you read the description, these guys poison you by squirting you with pus from the many pimples that cover their bodies. That is awesome and fucking gross. The menu system is a little clunky, but it's something you get used to. Considering how complex all the customization is, it could have been a lot worse. Hey, this game is 20 years old. Set your standards accordingly. The soundtrack is excellent, though not really catchy or melodic. Now in the past, I've held a lack of melody against a game, but the music here expertly complements the mood and atmosphere of the Haunted Mansion, which is exactly what it needed to do. Maybe not iPod-worthy like most other Capcom titles, but it understands its role in a game like this. I've used a lot of hyperbole in talking about Sweet Home, but I'll admit, I really have no idea if this game truly is the most graphic or gory game on the NES, because technically it's a Japanese Famicom game. I have never been, nor do I have any interest in the import scene. There are probably a couple hundred Famicom games that were never released in America, so it's fair to say that there may be an even more obscure Famicom game that's way more violent and grim than Sweet Home. So let me save myself a few dozen emails by saying this was just a gift from a friend and I have no interest in reviewing other reproduction carts or import games. I've got my hands full enough with domestic games. This was just a one-off kind of deal. And now I am officially done with Halloween. So, back by popular demand, more hilarious Halloween jokes. Let's see. And yes, I am going to review the Splatterhouse remake, as if there was any doubt. not quite done with Halloween yet. I got one last game to talk about. Ghoul Patrol for the Super Nintendo. Gah, what a horrible game. Take Zombies Ate My Neighbors and remove any sense of technique or skill and you've got Ghoul Patrol. The story goes, this game was sort of stuck in development and the producers were having trouble completing a game the publisher could be happy with. Then, Zombies Ate My Neighbors came out and they quickly decided to patch things up to make it look like a sequel. At the time, it was quietly advertised as the sequel to Zombies Ate My Neighbors, but it's clearly not a sequel, it's a very pale imitation. The whole time I was playing it, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd much rather be playing Zombies Ate My Neighbors. But you might say, dude, that's your problem. It's not the game's fault you can't suppress your feelings, which would be fair to say, but Ghoul Patrol is constantly reminding me of Zombies Ate My Neighbors. It's got borrowed sound effects and game mechanics. Like I said, it's constantly reminding me of a much better game I'd rather be playing. But to be fair, it does do a few things differently. You still have 10 victims to save in each level, but instead of a radar, they just yell at you. Which isn't as accurate as a radar, but it adds a bit of extra challenge, so yeah, that's fair. Oh, and there's a story, complete with a boring, unnecessary, and long opening. Oh man, check out this stupid fat dialogue, Brosef. Man, are these kids ever with it? Ugh, why did the producers think that I needed a backstory to this game? It's not like they're trying to tie it into Zombies Ate My Neighbors or anything. How about instead you give me more hilariously cheesy level names? Nope, instead we get teeth that explode when they chomp down. Lame. Okay, one awesome thing. Instead of drinking a potion to become a monster, you become the Grim Fucking Reaper. Holy shit, this is badass. And you can still save people too. I figured like if you were the Grim Reaper and you touch people, they would die. Nah, go figure. But you can't jump while you're the Grim Reaper. And sometimes you need to. Like here, I just wasted a Grim Reaper potion. An example of a game not fully tested or thought through. Oh, and that reminds me, you can jump in Ghoul Patrol. Because hey, what was one thing that Zombies Ate My Neighbors was missing? Platforming! And above pits of instant death! 
and jumping is a huge pain in the ass because you walk with momentum. Now on Zombies Ate My Neighbors, you were either running top speed or you were stopped, which above all made it easy to evade enemies. And you really need to evade enemies here because they spawn faster than they did in Gauntlet. And with so many things on the screen, it's hard to properly maneuver around them because it takes a moment before you can get up to top speed and outrun them. However, most enemies start to sprint when they get close to you and they can run faster than you can walk. It is super easy for them to corner you and drain your health. What else? Oh yeah, exits. They don't appear near you after you save the last victim. They appear in a set place. But it's never convenient. Like, take this level for example. There's a victim located in the very top right hand corner. And the way the level is designed, it's pretty much a given you'll get to him last. But where does the exit appear? At the start of the level, at the very bottom left hand corner. God, this game is garbage. Okay, the one and only improvement. Ghoul Patrol allowed you to cycle back through your items. But you still can't cycle back through your weapons, so whatever. Alright, I can't stand to play this game anymore. Here are the facts, the irrefutable truths. Ghoul Patrol is available on the Wii Virtual Console for 800 Wii Points, and so is Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Furthermore, if you want to track down a physical copy of Zombies Ate My Neighbors, it'll net you around 20-30 bucks. And so will Ghoul Patrol. In fact, Ghoul Patrol might be more expensive because it's technically more rare than Zombies Ate My Neighbors. No matter how you slice it, Ghoul Patrol is the same price or sometimes more expensive than Zombies Ate My Neighbors, a game that is better in every possible way. If you want more Zombies Ate My Neighbors action, give Herc's Adventure a shot. I hear it's pretty good, though I've still never played it myself. If you really like Ghoul Patrol, it's probably because you've never played Zombies Ate My Neighbors, which you should do instead. I'll see you on the next... Game Quickie! It's a fun, scary, good time. But we all know that story and setting don't make a good game. If a game ain't fun to play, it isn't going to be any fun at all. So, is Sweet Home fun to play? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, fuck you and your stupid worthless gun, Kenji. Let's move the really expensive Saturn games out of the way. <laughs> so don't get it broken. You probably say, that's it? Doesn't sound so great. Because it was the way he spoon-fed the details through you. To you, through. Ah, almost. He, he spoon-fed them through you. <laughs> Murdered you with a spoon. Filled with the hot porridge of the story. Why aren't you focusing? There. Wait a minute, is that a bunny? Oh, it's just a... Oh, it's just a fence post sticking out of the snow. I wanted to kill a bunny. <laughs> uh. Whoa! Whoa! Yeah, that's acting right there. The screen's not actually on. I'm just pretending it's acting. Okay. Whoa! Like a body... It's really a shame there wasn't like a body temperature mechanic. Stop, folk. Oh, damn focus. Come on, get focused, you piece of shit. And for a game this old, two out of three believable games. He's a man who'd like to do his own thing. And you can tell in D, Enemy Zero, and D2 that these are games that he wants to make. Ah, there we go. Hey, everybody. I'm in focus now. D2 was among the first games developed for the Dreamcast. However, it wasn't released until late August of 2000, almost one year after the system had been released. Ha! Ah! Oh, God. I don't know why that was so much trouble. Yeah, characters ramble on and on, but the actual dialogue ain't bad. And more importantly, that voice work is top notch. Ha! Ah! Ah! Ha! Oh! Ah! Oh, that better be it. Oh my god. Oh my god. You have no idea, for whatever fucking reason, how long it took me to do. So you have a few guns with unlimited ammo, but you have to depend on first aid sprays to keep your health up? Nah, there's another way to replenish your health. Hunting. But the 
NPC dialogue in Earthbound is so good. Take my word for it. Ugh, getting thirsty. I ain't drinking that shit. And this is the reason I love new Splatterhouse. For how hyper-violent it is, it has a surprisingly strong moral core. And I'm... Fuck! Ah, oh, man. Hey kid, I'm a computer. Go save the world. Stop all the downloading. But I will mention... Oh, shit. But I will mention... Fuck! <laughs> fuck! What am I doing? It's far from the rarest Nintendo Entertainment System cart. Tridge. <laughs> Try that again. Okay. Hey, you. Ah, much better. Much better than mine. Mm. I act better when I've had a few. Clash of Demon Head isn't a quick action fix. It's a pretty lengthy adventure that d d that does requires dedication. <laughs> fuck. It's far from the rarest NES cart. Almost. Fuck. Almost. And would be a mainstay until the magazine stops tracking NES games. Stopped tracking. That stops. Fuck. But just like with all the previous games, you never get the line right. <laughs> You're gonna be lost in no time. Now, that next line is gonna be something great that requires a certain level of dedication. But some of you. Oh, man. Ness is one of the most unlikely leads of any RPG, and is therefore among. The oh, shit. What the fuck is the line? He's also not some punk who on his 16th birthday must purge the land of corrupt tyrants and evil kings. Fuck. Now some of you might be no. Wow. But trust me, when you finish a game, especially when you know the line. Fuck. Oh god damn it. Where the hell am I supposed to go? The weak weapons, weak bosses, and a weak soundtrack. It's. Oh. Nope. Come up. <laughs> oh, there it is. That's a good thing. Wine doesn't make you burp. Oh shit! 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 Did did that just happen? You probably there for became a fan. Let's do it again. For RPGs, one of the most important rules of thumb is to whenever you get to badabo do, but the badabo do, badabo do, badabo do. That's fucking rad. So I'm gonna be talking about a new video game that. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> it's not a new video game. So you name a baby. I'd see a baby on the street to call him Chrono. <laughs> oh, it's tough. You also got a name. You gotta pick names for him. Hank. All Hank. Cause. <laughs> Next week, we're gonna play, play this. Play this, what was that, big box? Play Zerpbound. <laughs> Let's try that again. We should do more of these? I don't know, if you give me the juice, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll review games for juice. Cause it's good juice. What do you want us? It's not juice, dog. Cause it's good juice. You call that juice? Yeah, so do I. I, I call it apple juice. Ah, uh, where the hell am I supposed to go? <laughs> I'm getting low with Derek on HVGN. Hey, I'm uh, I'm just uh, I'm playing some games. I'm uh, yeah, we're yeah, playing games. <laughs>